Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started close to on time because we have many people who are joining us via webcast and they've been staring at a blank screen <laughs> for a couple of minutes and that can uh, start to get old pretty fast. My name is Gabrielle Tayek and I'm a historian at the National Museum of the American Indian in the Museum Scholarship Group. As the moderator of today's program, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Museum of the National, the National Museum of the American Indian to Quantum Leap, Does Indian Blood Still Matter? I also extend a warm welcome to our virtual audience who are watching on the webcast. There, we actually got a very large response from people on a global level. There are people in Europe watching, um, in the Pacific Islands, and others who will be tuning in. We also know that this is being broadcast to several museums and universities. So I'd like to give my greetings to all of you who we can't see today. And I, it was really interesting because I think given social media, we were able to get this out, so we have a, maybe blood quantum will go viral. I, I don't know if that will happen or not. This program is part of the Smithsonian-wide conversation about race. The exhibition Race, Are We So Different? is on view at the National Museum of Natural History. Um, it started in June, and it'll be there until January 8th, 2012, and it will be traveling, it has been traveling around the country. So I really encourage you to go see this exhibition if you haven't done so already. Today's program is funded by a Smithsonian grant to the Consortia Project, which is called Let's Talk About Race at the Smithsonian. And we're very, very grateful uh, for the generous support for this, for this program and for this distinguished panel. I would also like to acknowledge the research support that I got from my graduate intern, who is a graduate student at Berkeley, Maddie Harper, did quite a bit of work last summer getting this ready, and also to especially thank our symposia coordinator, Elizabeth Kennedy Gish. Um, without her work, um, none of this would have happened, all the little details and the staff and everybody who's here who pulled together to make this happen. I'd like to make a few housekeeping remarks. If you have a cell phone, please take this opportunity to turn it off um, so we don't disturb the program. And after our last presentation, our speakers, I'm going to be introducing our speakers one at a time. And after the program is over, um, I'll have them come back up to the stage. So I'd ask you to hold your questions until after everybody's had their chance to present. They'll get about 20 minutes each. And then I'd really like to open it up um, to the floor. We have a microphone in the back so you can get up and um, ask your questions, make your comments. Uh, this should be an interesting conversation. It's a, been a conversation that people have been having for a very, very long time. And uh, our director, Kevin Gover, just sent me a link that I got this morning that in the New York Times, <laughs> last night at 8, about 8.15, uh, last night there is an opinion uh, page in debate with a number of scholars, policymakers, community members, uh, regarding the tensions between tribal sovereignty and racial justice, particularly um, in relation to the Cherokee Freedmen debate, which is going on right now. So all of these issues are up front and center for us. They're not archaic, old matters. Um, these are things that people live with every day. If all had gone according to plan, um, we would not be sitting in this auditorium talking about Indian blood. I'm not referring to anything like not getting funds or not finding a room or not getting our act together in time, but instead I'm talking about the larger assimilation plan. Indeed, nobody was even supposed to have had a blood quantum to worry about anymore. Native people were supposed to have been absorbed and assimilated into the superior civilization, so-called, a hundred years ago. I just looked up recently that um, Theodore Roosevelt in his 1901 State of the Union uh, said, in my judgment, the time has arrived when we should definitely make up our minds to recognize the Indian as an individual and not as a member of a tribe. The General Allotment Act is a mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass. And you know, when I, when I read those words and as you think about them, this was just a little bit over a hundred years ago. It wasn't that long ago. And also thinking about the fact that this was a key statement in a State of the Union address. And the Indian problem and the Indian question and the matters of advancing to civilization um, that blood quantum was part and parcel of at the time 
uh, was really something that was on the national stage. It was part of our dialogue. And then part of me also wondered, you know, when was the last time a president um, spent so much time talking about Indians in the State of the Union <laughs> address? So that was, that was an interesting question as well. In spite of hundreds of years of best efforts, the plan did not entirely work, although it has had devastating intergenerational consequences. A question remains, and I'll note a couple of phrases often heard in association with debates on blood quantum. Is blood quantum a form of paper genocide? Or is it reinventing the enemy's language to uphold sovereignty? Or is it something else? Is it somewhere in between? Is there something um, that we can talk about that um, goes beyond these things or incorporates them? Is it an either-or situation? So the mere fact that we come here today with a vast array of opinions, lived experiences, and perspectives is a good and healthy indicator of the fact that Native people still matter and our issues still matter. And this is not only an Indian issue, it's not only something that we talk about because these policies and contexts have been set up um, through a larger society. So I, you know, to think about, I'd like everybody also to think about the fact of what does this mean um, to a pluralistic democracy in the 21st century? aside from what maybe is, is going on in your minds either individually or in specific matters that you're talking about, why is this something that we're speaking about on a national level? Also, the United States is quite unique in the world. Um, the U.S. is, I believe, the only country, um, if not um, the only, uh, that actually uh, has some kind of blood quantum. And the U.S. is also very unique in the sense of how Native people are identified. It's really one of the, I think it's about the only place in the Western Hemisphere where there's not kind of a mid-category of people. There's no mestizo or meti people recognized um, really as such in the United States. So we're dealing in a, in a very interesting context. I know it tends to be that you, you tend to think about the United States as our, our only context, but there are many different approaches that have, taken over, have been taken over time. There are also many ways that we could have formed a panel to help us think through blood quantum. And we decided to take an angle that would provide a historical, sociological, and somewhat scientific context to this dialogue. Uh, we were chatting a little bit over lunch um, with our uh, director and thinking about the fact that often policy is made, um, we make law, legislation is made, uh, items are debated out on the floor. Uh, we all have very um, strongly held emotional opinions, um, and perhaps they are informed by our own experience, but what is the larger context? So we wanted to take some time in taking an angle where we can start to think about how did we get here? What sits behind this matter? What are the broader contexts? What's the analytics involved? And then perhaps we can start to talk about this um, in a more informed way. So it's helpful sometimes to, you know, step back a bit and think about how a policy came to be and how it might transform into the future. So with all of that said, I'd, I'd like to get us going. Um, there's more biographical information in your programs about each of the speakers, so I'm just going to highlight a little bit about each of them. Our first speaker today is Dr. Eva Marie Garut. Eva received a PhD in sociology from Princeton University and is now an associate professor of sociology at Boston College. Her work is both scholarly and practical and truly necessary to understanding the contemporary Native experience. Many of us have all sorts of ideas about what is or what is not going on in Indian country, often based on an anecdote or a personal experience or some, some other newsworthy kind of topic. Sometimes it's very tribally specific. We, we, you know, tend to look at these within our own communities. But Eva actually surveys people um, so that we can get an accurate picture of what the lived experience is now. So I am extremely thrilled that she will share her work with us. Uh, help me welcome Eva Marie Garut. And I just, I advanced this slide by accident. Hi there. 
thank you so much for inviting me. And I believe that uh, one of the reasons that they invited me to speak to you today uh, was that I have, as Gabby observed, written a book titled Real Indians that uh, takes up a lot of the ways that uh, Indian people talk about um, who's Indian enough to be Indian, basically. And frankly, sometimes we're kind of mean to each other about it. Um, so that publishing that book has led to, let we say, some rousing further discussions for me. Um, but there's a, there's a, there's a lot of um, variation uh, in the ways that people talk uh, about Indian blood and what it means. And I'm going to talk about some of those possibilities. Um, that whole idea about Indian blood can get kind of fuzzy. Uh, but when social scientists uh, have used this idea, at least for most of the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, we've tended to share some basic agreements. Um, in general, we social scientists um, have generally agreed that Indian blood has something to do with one's biological ancestry, which implies descent from the original inhabitants of this country, which became the United States. And this idea of Indian blood undergirds, in fact, an area of social scientific inquiry known as kinship studies in American Indian communities. And those studies map out uh, family trees in particular tribes. So who's related to whom and what responsibilities different categories of relatives have to each other, grandparents, parents, cousins, that sort of thing. Um, and this type of research also commonly incorporates this idea of something that we call genealogical distance. And that concept of genealogical distance is grounded in this idea that ancestral connections can be close or not so close. The general idea is that you're more closely related to your parents than you are to your grandparents. You're more closely related to your first cousin than your second cousins, and so on. The basic concepts of biological ancestry and genealogical distance that we find in the social sciences have been developed in other contexts into this quanta, into this concept of blood quantum that we're here to talk about today. And blood quantum is this way of uh, formalizing, even quantifying, the idea of genealogical distance for bureaucratic purposes, mainly. And these bureaucratic purposes would include things like determining who inherits treaty rights, uh, who has the right to become a legal citizen of an Indian tribe, things like that. And Indian people are often issued a document by the federal government that records their specific blood quantum um, or the amount of ancestry that they have, and that's called a certificate of degree of Indian blood. Now, blood quantum is this very mechanical measure of Indian identity or Indian ancestry, and what I mean by that is take a look at this page, um, which is a page from the Bureau of Indian Affairs training manual that illustrates um, how it is that you calculate Indian Indian blood. Um, so this is used by people like tribal registrars or other officials uh, who oversee the process of getting people formally recorded as tribal citizens. And it shows you this is how you calculate blood quantum. And so it shows Indian blood uh, as this physical substance that parents contribute to their children. Um, each parent bestows half of his or her blood uh, on the child. So here in this graphic we have um, a father who is four-fourths Indian what people would often call full blood, uh, and a mother who's one quarter Indian, and their child turns out uh, to be five eighths Indian. So in this picture, you see um, the child is filled up to the level of five eighths with Indian blood. Now, and, and I look at this, and I'm always thinking, now if you could just top that kid up a little bit, you know, he, 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 he'd make it up to three quarters of a tank. Um, but, you know, too bad for him. Once you're born, it's done. There's no change in that. That's how much blood he's got. The end. So, you know, you can look at even, that's a really simple example, right? Um, but you look at that and you realize pretty quick that over time that those calculations can become infinitesimally precise. Uh, people's ancestry can be parsed into so many 30 seconds, 60 fourths, 128ths, and so on and on. There's no limit to it. Um, every time there's another union, 
between someone with Indian blood and someone without, the blood quantum of any child is going to be cut in half. And in fact, some of you, when you came in, I had a, another page as a handout that you could pick up um, outside the door there, uh, which is another page from the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, training manual. Uh, and what it is, uh, is a table that gives you uh, a means of calculating blood quantum in specific cases. And so it's kind of this quick reference uh, for dealing with difficult cases, like supposing you have a child who's got one parent with a 21 30 seconds blood quantum, and the other parent has a 13 16 blood quantum, then what is the child? And if you look at that table and you follow the relevant column down and the relevant row across, it will tell you that this child is 47 60 fourths. So basically, you look at that table. If you're Indian, you can locate yourself. You are on there somewhere. Um, so at this point, you might well ask, you know, why, why is there all the fuss about the exact calculation of genealogical distance? Like, why would the federal government be so interested in counting Indian people down to the last corpuscle? Why do we have, why do we have a table like that? Well, there is a reason. Um, such calculations are necessary because individuals who are determined under a whole range of federal and tribal laws are eligible to receive certain legal rights. And some of those rights are really important. Like, here's a list of some of them. Many of the laws that determine who is eligible to receive rights like this, like treaty rights, certain arrangements in relation to state taxes, not federal taxes, uh, and so on and so forth, as you see on that screen, um, get back directly or indirectly to the person's blood quantum. That is, for many legal purposes, not all of them, but for many legal purposes, people need to establish that they have a, some minimum amount of, in, of Indian ancestry as measured by blood quantum to receive those sorts of rights. A lot of times, uh, the minimum blood quantum that people have to establish to qualify for rights like this is a quarter. So in that simple case, or uh, in the most simple case, supposing you have one of, one of your four grandparents is of exclusive Indian ancestry, and then your other relatives are white, that would make you one quarter. That would make your blood quantum one quarter. And that blood quantum could qualify you for certain legal rights, although there are many exceptions to that generalization. Um, and at this point, I guess I, I, I would also add it, but it's not just a matter of Indian people being some kind of super citizen that get all this, get all these things, right? Um, by virtue of their blood ancestry, individuals who demonstrate that they are American Indian people, uh, to the satisfaction of the federal government, and or their tribe are also subjected to particular responsibilities. It's not just all about rights, it's also about responsibilities. And some of the responsibilities of being legally identified as an Indian person can weigh pretty heavily. Uh, of special note are issues related to criminal prosecution. Indian people who commit certain types of crimes against other Indian people on reservations can be subjected to very different criminal processes than other Americans. Uh, and that state of affairs may very much not work to their interests. Uh, for example, Indian people can be subjected to federal prosecution for offenses that their non-Indian neighbors would only face state prosecution. And because the standards are, evi are, are diff the standards of evidence are different in federal court, or in state court, um, convictions can come more easily even for the, for the same crime in federal courts. So for Indian people to be subjected to, um, or answerable to federal rather than state prosecution can be a really significant responsibility that distinguishes them from other American people. And there are, there are other unique responsibilities that people who are defined uh, as Indian people also bear. But that example gives you an idea um, that it's really consequential how, how people are defined and that to be defined as an Indian person under law doesn't imply just special rights, but also special responsibilities. So that's why both the federal government and Indian tribes themselves are concerned to establish uh, what people's blood quantum actually is because these other the various pieces of legislation incorporate that as a standard. 
uh, for identifying people. So we get back to the title of this panel, which asks, does blood quantum matter? And everything I've said so far would suggest, yes, it does. It can matter a whole lot. Um, but there's a somewhat different question we could ask, too, which is, what is blood? What is blood quantum? Are there different ways to think about those ideas? So I want to invite you into some different ways of looking at those questions. Um, first, it might occur to you that the whole system of blood quantum represents a particular perspective that rests not only on our accepting the idea that blood is all about biology, it also requires certain other assumptions that bear thinking about. Uh, the perspective whereby blood equals biology asks, asks us to conceive the nature of blood in particular ways. And these assumptions about what blood is and how it acts would include assumptions like these, except that my slide won't advance. <laughs> Hmm, got any ideas about that? <laughs> oh, there we go. It did. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Technological crisis. <laughs> okay, first, um, blood as it has been conceived by social scientists, at least over a very long period, seems to act like a physical substance. It's basically some kind of thing that you inherit from your parents that makes you what you are in some fundamental sense. And nowadays, blood may actually have become some kind of shorthand or idiomatic expression for something else, like maybe people's genetic material. But in any event, the idea of blood, quantum, seems to imply that blood is something that has the properties of a physical substance. Um, in particular, blood of one kind, under this logic, can get diluted when it's mixed with other kinds of blood. Eventually, it can even basically run out altogether. So when you get to some specific cutoff point, a person's Indian blood can be seen as so depleted by admixture that it's basically extinguished and you're no longer Indian. Um, and really, again, that, that's that idea of genealogical distance, right? Um, in that perspective where blood equals biology. And there's more. This perspective invites us to assume that this physical thing we're calling blood is measurable, in fact, really precisely, and blood is conceived in this perspective as what we sociologists and other statistically-minded cranks uh, call a continuous variable. That is, it can take on a whole range of values, like the fraction that you see on that handout that you picked up. Another assumption entailed in the perspective that equates blood with biology is that blood describes some innate characteristic that people acquire only at birth. Blood makes you into a certain type of person at the most fundamental level, and that quality is fixed and unchanging. That's why, in the U.S. at least, federal rules make no provision for legally adopted children of another race becoming legally recognized as Indian. The assumption is that unless children are born to an Indian parent, they can't possibly have the physical substance that, makes, that would make them Indian. So blood, in this view, creates this fixed actuality that can never change. It doesn't matter what language you speak, what culture you were raised in, how others identify you, um, it's fixed when you're born. So assumptions like that, if you're willing to make assumptions like that, it may also makes it pretty reasonable to use a measure like blood quantum to measure that substance you call Indian blood. So it's one perspective that Americans can take and do take on how people are sorted into racial groups, in particular this racial group of Indian. But the panel organizers today asked me to talk about whether people who participated in my book project seem to be expressing any other kinds of ideas. Did their remarks suggest other ways that people might think about who should be considered as an Indian person and how the idea of something like blood figures into all of that? Now, to take on that question means wading into some very controversial waters. Um, Indian people have lots of ideas about those things. 
I mean, heck, they have so many ideas about it that I got a whole book out of interviewing them on that, right? So, so yay, but <laughs> that tells you it's a pretty complex subject. Um, so I'm going to tell you about just a few of those ideas really quickly, and I don't want uh, to imply that what I'm going to say is the right way to think about these really complicated issues. I don't mean to imply it's a better way to think about Indianness for every purpose. Than the, I don't mean to apply it's better than the one I just discussed. I don't mean that it's a perspective that all Indian people would agree with. I'm just picking one strand out of the conversations uh, that I had with people and that it's possible to encounter in Indian country because it suggests some alternative assumptions by which it's possible, at least, to think about Indian blood. It teaches us maybe something about the existence of a different kind of logic for thinking about blood than the one that you find in important places like the Bureau of Indian Affairs Training Manual, um, or laws governing tribal citizenship, or a lot of social science writing. So I'll just suggest some of those alternative ideas about Indian blood by showing you a few quotations uh, from Indian people that appear in my book. Uh, some of these come from published remarks of American Indian scholars who study race uh, and identity, and some of them are from just regular folks that I interviewed while writing my book. And these, now these, so these people are from different tribes. Uh, they certainly wouldn't agree about everything, but you may be able to pick up some threads of ideas uh, from what they're saying. So I'll just throw myself into this with a quote uh, from Dr. Jack Forbes. Uh, he's a Powhatan and Delaware anthropologist. And he has an arresting way of inviting us into questions about blood and blood quantum. And he does it by uh, asking us to try and figure out if tribes a long time ago had such concepts and how they thought about them. And he concludes, yes, uh, historically it appears that tribes did have ideas about blood and how it was created. Back before European contact, Indian people clearly didn't have to figure out how to sort people into racial groups like Indian and black and white because there were no black and white people. But what tribes did have to do, and something that they took very seriously, was they had to sort people into clans within particular tribes. Clans are subgroups within many tribes. You can think of a clan as an extended family within a tribe because all the members of the same clan are considered to be close blood relatives. Also in many tribes, the clan is really the fundamental basis of belonging and relationship. It can define everything about a person's place in the world, including, for instance, who you can marry, who you can have just sort of casual relationships with, all kinds of things. So Forbes hopes that we can get a handle on ideas about what blood has meant in historic tribal contexts if we think about how people were assigned to particular clans within a tribe. How did the blood relationship of clan get established way back when? What assumptions about how blood works can we divine by looking at these processes of how people got sorted into clans? So to answer that, Forbes gives an example that will be recognizable to many tribes even today. In this system of assigning clan identity, a person inherits his clan not only, uh, or inherits his clan only from his mother. So whatever clan uh, a mother is, that's what her kids will be too. And this means that kids always have to marry someone in a different clan than the one to which they and their mother belong. They can't marry into the clan they share with their mother because that would mean marrying a, a close blood relative, and that's incestuous. Tribes like Cherokees and Creeks think about clan relationship that way. So do many others. So here's what Forbes says about this way of conceptualizing blood in light of clan ru rules. In certain tribes, he says, people Persons are understood to be descended in the female line from a first ancestor, usually a being with an animal or plant name. If, for example, one is a member of the turtle mat matrilineal lineage, one might find this situation. 500 generations ago, the first turtle woman lived. 
and in each subsequent generation her female descendants had to marry men who were non-turtles, that is, with other lineages in their female lines. A modern-day turtle person, then, might well be, in quantitative terms, one five-hundredth turtle and four hundred ninety-nine five-hundredths non-turtle. And yet, at the same time, be completely and totally a turtle person. Now, that way of reckoning blood relationship is really different from the way used in legal definitions based on blood quantum, right? In the way of thinking that Forbes is making you see, blood is not irrelevant to who a person is. In fact, it's terribly important. It determines your clan. Still, you don't get the idea here of blood as a physical substance. Blood here is not something that makes sense to quantify. It doesn't get diluted. It doesn't run out. If you were measuring it as a physical thing, it would necessarily get cut in half with each generation. But in the logic Forbes is showing you, people are not understood to be more distant relatives by virtue of that. Everyone in your same clan is your close blood relative. In this logic, blood really doesn't seem like something you'd sensibly measure by a standard like blood quantum. Now, at this point, if you just saw that quote, you might conclude we're talking about a perspective here that's basically a version of the one drop rule that once governed the assignment of people of African ancestry to the racial category of black, if they had any black ancestry at all. But that might be too hasty because if you hang around Indian people very long, you can hear some qualifying remarks. People who contributed to my book, at least, usually didn't conclude that Indianness was all about blood. They were not likely to tell me that anyone who could identify an Indian ancestor from whom they had inherited some blood would or should be accepted as an Indian person. Instead, many people seem to qualify the significance of Indian blood by talking about the importance of, expect, of accepting the responsibilities to act in a particular way. For example, the Mohawk scholar of religious studies, Christopher Jocks, has written about blood conceptualized in terms of kinship rather than in terms of biology, and he talks about what he calls the ability to participate in kinship. He talks about kinship as a skill. That skill is not invariably tied to one's blood connections either. So he says this, in every Indian community I am aware of, there are a few non-Indians who have gained entry into kinship relations. Generosity of time and spirit, respect and politeness, willingness to help out, and openness to learn are what our elders seem to value most. And all of us who pursue this work in American Indian studies know non-Indians who have succeeded in it. But the same logic works in reverse, too. He goes on to say at the end there, there are full-blood Indians who have lost the ability to participate in kinship. So here you've got this kind of idea of blood relationship as something that can be, and usually is, of ultimate importance but only along with something else. The something else here might actually even override the blood that's implied in genealogical descent. Blood relationship here is a kind of potentiality, but it's only realized fully in reciprocating relationships. By this logic, if you don't honor the obligations of kinship in your behavior, the sacred reality of ancestry may not save you. In this view, at least, people can surrender the rights and responsibilities that ordinarily attend biological ancestry. So there's a different way of thinking about blood that doesn't seem to have much to do with simple calculations of blood quantum, right? And here's one last interesting example of how some people that I included in my book thought about what blood is and does. And this one comes from a friend of mine whom I interviewed. Uh, he's an Osage and Cherokee man who is a congressman to the Osage Nation. His name is Archie Mason, and he told me that along with his biological Osage and Cherokee ancestry, 
Okay, we're going to assume that this is going to advance at some point. There we go. Hallelujah. <laughs> Along, he says, along with my Osage and Cherokee ancestry, I can claim to be Ponca because of a relationship of two women long ago in the 19th century. A Ponca woman and an Osage woman, who was my relation, took each other as sisters. There are a few people today who still acknowledge that relationship. Those of us that do, we are blood related because of that. That adoption was a very special ceremony held on the Arkansas River between the Osages and the Poncas. There was a connection between families. And today, I have Ponca people who are my family. We recognize each other as blood. We're the same. I know that, and it affects me. In other words, this respondent wouldn't argue that usually people acquire Indian blood from birth. But in some cases, they might acquire it later. In particular, he's talking about ceremony as the vehicle for a powerful transformation. In that transformation, the object of the ceremony becomes a different kind of person. In his case, a person related to other Ponca people in fundamentally the same way that these, those born with Ponca ancestry are related, by blood. And the person who had the transformative experience is able to pass it on to her descendants in a real way, those descendants are forever capable of living as specifically Ponca people. Or maybe we should say that they are able to do this as long as they remember their responsibilities as Ponca people. So those are just a few examples of some ideas that some Indian people may have about Indian blood and what it means. Um, if we put them together, we can kind of list them in the same way that we did uh, that other perspective that I told you earlier. This idea of if we think that blood equals kinship, we have an idea of blood as a sacred quality, a discrete variable. You either are or you aren't. You aren't sort of. Um, it can be innate or acquired in other ways besides birth, particularly via transformation by ceremony. And it's a potentiality that's, or that's realized in reciprocating relationships. And we can even sort of put those two sets of ideas side by side. Um, so to summarize, there's, there's lots of different ways of thinking about blood and its meanings. They often bear on the question of whether the whole idea of blood quantum actually makes sense. And uh, here I've given you a summary of two possible ways of thinking about questions about blood. And I want, to, I want to emphasize, I'm not telling you the right way to think about Indian blood. I'm certainly not telling you how all social scientists uh, think, how all Indian people think. I'm not trying to tell you that. I'm just trying to identify some of the assumptions that come into play when we talk about this idea of blood quantum. And I've tried to show you some examples of, of people thinking in ways uh, that don't actually even seem to suggest the idea of blood quantum. So I hope I've shown you that the concept of blood quantum is a choice that we make. It might be useful for certain purposes, maybe even indispensable for certain purposes. But there are alternative ways to think. Um, tribes have a lot of purposes for which they answer the question, who are we? Um, in addition to this idea of blood quantum, we also, all of our tribes have a historical experience of having to answer that question of who are we? And they've done it in lots of different ways. And I think that we don't need to be afraid of um, remembering together what some of those ways are and, and understanding that different logics are possible besides the one that's most familiar uh, in, in, the, in the larger culture. So thank you very much. Okay, I think that got us to a good comprehensive overview and gave us a lot to think about. Um, our next, and this room really filled up, that's great. Our next speaker is Dr. Melinda Maynor Lowry. 
She's an assistant professor of history at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I'd like to say that it's really a special delight for me to welcome Melinda back to her NMAI home. Uh, she was an intern in our film and video center some years ago before she went into the world of uh, text <laughs> in her doctoral program at Chapel Hill. Uh, Melinda works in a multidimensional world that really enlivens history using uh, the visual, the oral, the textual, musical, auditory, and always comes back to a community center. So please join me in welcoming Melinda Maynard Lowry. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank Gabby and Elizabeth for inviting me and for organizing this terrific event. And also take a moment to remember um, Helen Sherbeck, who many of you probably knew. She uh, was a wonderful Lumbee woman and leader who was instrumental to this museum and had a great influence on me, and I miss her very much. I hope she's looking down. Um, Eva, in her book, Real Indians, if you haven't picked it up yet, go get it. Run, run to Amazon.com and get it. Because as one of the ways she makes clear uh, her points about Indian identity is by a cute illustration where she lists some jokes as, as if our racial hierarchy was turned around. Indians might ask white people, where is your powdered wig? What's the meaning of the square dance? And these are the kinds of things that turn stereotypes on their heads, right? And uh, instead of being asked, how much Indian are you, which is a question I get asked a lot, I want to be asked, how much white are you? I recently learned, actually, of two white ancestors I never knew about. I don't know their tribe, but I'm so excited that I'm 164th white. Um, what do I get? You know, how can I sign up? Where do I learn more? Um, but I'm here to tell you actually today about the very different ways Lumbee people tend to think about these things. Do we have any Lums in the audience? Shout out. Woo. All right. Well, what we ask each other when we meet is, who's your people? I'll be asking you after we talk. Who's your people? Um, and I'll tell you who my people are. My grandparents on my mother's side are Foy and Bloss Cummings from the St. Anna community. My grandparents on my father's side are Wayne and Lucy Maynard from the Red Banks community. And that is my version, our Lumbee version of, of our clan affiliations. And being part of and writing about the Lumbee community means that history always emerges into the present. And these kinds of encounters give me more information with which to tell the story. I'll tell you one now and a few others before we're finished. I have a Lumbee family, as I've just told you. Both of my parents are Lumbees. All my relatives are Lumbees, except those two white ancestors that I just found out about. I'm Lumbee. I'm Indian. That's it. Uh, but many scholars, both Southern and American, think of Lumbees as a tri-racial or as a multi-ethnic or multi-something group. They look at our phenotypes and our history as apparent anomalies in the black and white South, and presume that our quantity of Indian blood must be very small, if any. Lumbees themselves have taken steps to address this image, and one of those steps was to create a tribal role in the 1980s. Every so often, tribal members have to re-register with the enrollment office in Pembroke, North Carolina, the largest town in the Lumbee community, and the location of the tribal government's offices. In 2001, intending to re-register, I walked into the office without my membership card, but with my father and brother, who had their documentation. At first, the enrollment officer told me she couldn't find my genealogy chart, and she, she suggested that I didn't have one, even though my father and brother had charts. We politely asked her to look again. Sure enough, a few minutes later, she emerged with my chart, her demeanor transformed from slightly hostile to very friendly. And this is what she showed me. Is this the little pointer thing? Okay, so this is my genealogy chart that's in the Lumbee basement of the <laughs> Tribal Enrollment Office. Look at this, she said, uh, pointing to the series of numbers and letters uh, that are above each of my ancestors' names going back all these generations. 
Um, she explained that the series of numbers and letters was a code linking each name to someone identified as Indian on the 1900 or 1910 census, the source documents on which the tribal role was based. There were 30 names on the chart, as you see approximately, and almost every one of them has a code, with the exception of my grandmother, uh, well, both my grandmothers who were born, obviously, after the 1910 census. Uh, the enrollment officer handed the chart to me, and smiling, she said in her classic Lumbee accent, Honey, now that's as full-blooded as you can get. And I was, like, stunned, cognitive dissonance just all over the place. Because this observation about blood is very rare in Lumbee, in Lumbee circles. The subject of quantities of Indian blood never comes up unless someone is making a pejorative statement about one's behavior, as in, well, he acts that way because his mother's white. Or even more vaguely, that family has bad blood. Read African American ancestry. So no wonder. Further, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that talking about fractions of blood is unheard of in the Lumbee community. Of course, to observers who believe Lumbees have little Indian blood, if any, the enrollment officer's statement is even more unexpected. A full blood Lumbee? Is that possible? They ask. Well, the book that I've recently published called Lumbee Indians in the Jim Crow South demonstrates how a community can affirm their identity as Indians despite and sometimes because of such challenges. Blood has a significance as a symbol of identity for Lumbees, especially in our political changes with the outside world. It's not surprising that I had this conversation in the tribal enrollment office. That office is ground zero for the tribal government's maintenance of identity boundaries. Enrollment officers determine the legitimacy of those who identify as Lumbees to fulfill requirements set forth by the federal government in its determinations of who the real Indians are. The history of those requirements and of Indians' relationships with the federal government is part of the story that this talk today is going to tell. Long before the Lumbees formed a tribal enrollment office, my ancestors engaged with the federal government around these issues of blood and identity. Lumbee blood is not the only important kind of blood either. Black blood and white blood have significance in this story as well. Blood is thus tied most frequently to identity conversations that take place in the political realm. But blood as a metaphor has social and familial origins, as Eva just pointed out. I was taught that our mixed racial ancestry doesn't make us any less lumpy. An outsider who marries in is able to stay in because he or she can live with and even adopt some of the symbols and attitudes that lumbies have used to maintain our community. The children of such unions are Lumbees because they have Lumbee family, and perhaps because they and their descendants stay in the community and contribute to it for generations, upholding the values their non-Indian ancestor initially embraced. Blood, as a component of Indian identity, has a history. For Indians in Robeson County, that history began around the same time these ideas acquired significance for many other Southerners, when white supremacists initiated the system of segregation in the late 19th century. My experience in the tribal enrollment office is just one part of the Lumbee story, which illuminates an even larger story of how Native American identity formation and affirmation continually changes. Identity formation took place under extreme pressure from white supremacy, both at the local and federal levels. And if y'all don't know what Lumbee land looks like, this is just a quick map um, about sort of the status of Lumbee land ownership around 1900 um, when Jim Crow began to form. All these little dots that you see are Lumbee owned parcels of land. So you kind of see that we don't have a reservation but we definitely have a land base and you might remember this slide a little bit later when I talk about uh, the idea of landless Indians. But we're going to begin in 1936 when the Office of Indian Affairs, now of course the Bureau of Indian Affairs, employed a physical anthropologist named Carl Seltzer to determine whether or not Robeson County's Indians qualified for acknowledgement under the Indian Reorganization Act, or IRA. Congress passed the IRA in 1934 and launched the major Indian policy reform period known as the Indian New Deal. 
To be eligible for acknowledgement under the IRA, an individual had to have at least one full-blood Indian parent, and his phenotype had to conform to physical anthropologist assessments of what such an individual might look like. The theory behind this requirement presumed that Indians with more Indian blood retained a greater degree of Indian culture and thus deserved federal acknowledgement. So when Carl Seltzer traveled to Robeson County, what he did was he put people on a platform and he had them hold their arms out like this. And he did a very kind of intimate test of their bodies. He measured their head size and shape. He looked at their teeth like they were horses. Um, he looked at their fingernails, the kind of sort of shape of their fingernails. He looked at the shape of their earlobes, whether they were attached or non-attached. It's very important. He um, would scratch a line along your breastbone and look at the color that was left behind and then how, far, how long it took the line to go, to, to go away. If it was a white mark that was left behind, you had more Indian blood. If it was a red mark that was left behind, you had more white blood. He also did something that Lumbees came to call the pencil test. He would put a pencil in your hair. If I had my hair down, you'd see it was very curly and bushy. He put a pencil in your hair. If it fell out, you had Indian hair. If it stayed in, guess what? You had Negroid hair. Okay? This is what constituted science at the time. Thank you, Western Europe. Um, officials at the Office of Indian Affairs recalled later that the Indian subjects stood around in amazement as they watched Seltzer do his work. But the, tr the officials had trouble communicating their criteria to their objects of study. Our task was made difficult at the outset, they remembered, by the fact that these people did not have a clear understanding of the term Indian. The examination surely mystified the Indian participants, who had their own very definite ideas about who they were. What's the source of this discrepancy between federal government ideas and identity and Indians' ideas? One factor was Robeson County Indians' existence within the Jim Crow South. Typically, the South, not just a region, but a mindset, has been portrayed as a solid bulwark against anything that looked like non-white equality or prosperity. Given what some historians have conveyed about Jim Crow, the one-drop rule, whites' obsession with skin color and physical features, etc., racial identity questions seem fairly straightforward. You were defined by your position relative to the black-white color line. It was the solid South, after all, not just in its voters' political preference for the Democratic Party, but in its approach to race relations. But we've learned that white supremacy was more complicated than that. Class, gender, personal relationships, capacity for violence, all had to do with maintaining a racial hierarchy during this period, not just skin color or blood. Historians seem to have recently come to agreement that the system of white supremacy can be more characterized by its exceptions than by its rules. Whites behaved in a solid way only in limited spaces and time frames, yet white supremacy was maintained through an effective and thorough enforcement of economic systems that kept non-whites dependent in elaborate social expectations of deference and humility and under the constant threat of violence. Our understanding of the origins of this system has also changed. White supremacists advocated the view that segregation was the only reasonable, humane response to the end of slavery, that the races had always been separated and should remain that, that way. Whites never questioned that they should be in control, but it took some time to develop an ideology of innate racial difference that justified the complete exile of African Americans from civil society. Segregation was tested and perfected first and foremost in cities, not in rural areas like the one you see here. This clue has led many historians on a trail that ends by concluding that segregation was not a natural outgrowth of agricultural pre-modern society, but was inseparable from modernity itself. The very substance of modernity, migration, industrialism, bureaucratic organization, the social anonymity that accompanies those phenomena mandated segregation as a form of social control. Jim Crow was a political response to changing historical conditions, not an ahistorical reaction to immutable biology. To quote historian Mark Schultz, who has written about white supremacy in the rural South, 
The modern impulse is to impose order first theoretically and then actually to make the crooked straight and the rough places plain. Modernists relied on scientific data, like that the Carl Seltzer was measuring, to subdivide their world, to make hierarchies, and to make their world manageable. A light bulb came on in my head one day when I realized that the anthropometric tests conducted by the BIA in Robeson County were part of the same historical process of America becoming modern. This immutable link between blood and culture that Commissioner John Collier's New Deal policy established was no different than the ideology of immutable racial difference that white supremacists had established in the South. Indians in Robeson County were sitting at the, at the junction of two converging, very modern trains, and while they might not have talked about it that way at the time, they definitely knew that they were going to get run over if they didn't do something. What's surprising and unexpected is how Indians embraced aspects of Southern identity in federal policy, incorporated them into Indian society, and participated fully in the production of modern American life, warts and all. Yet Indians also shaped Southern and American identity models to fit their own self-definitions. Looking at this led me to articulate identity construction as a two-part process. On the one hand, how members of the group define themselves to each other, and on the other hand, how they define themselves to outsiders. You can't talk about one without talking about the other. The Office of Indian Affairs was certainly employing its understandings of culture and its anthropometric tests of Robeson County Indians, and Indians made every effort to redefine, to redefine their understanding. This is one woman, B.D.M. Brooks, who was tested in 1936, and Seltzer took these kind of mug shots of each individual in addition to writing down all the measurements. Um, as Carl Seltzer set out to determine Native Americans' amounts of Indian blood, it became clear that blood meant different things to the BIA and to Indians. Native Americans determined blood relationships by genealogy. If one's ancestors and their relatives belonged to the Indian community, then that community accepted one as an Indian, regardless of how many non-Indian ancestors one had. When asked to describe their reasons for claiming Indian blood, Native Americans uniformly expressed themselves in terms of kinship and place. For example, one respondent said, my parents and grandparents handed it down to me. I was born among a nest of Indians and resided there ever since. I love that image, the nest of Indians. Another 62-year-old participant told questioners that my granddaddy and great-granddaddy said they were Indian people. Like, like, get over it, you know. Indian participants also pointed out ancestors who had signed treaties, spoken Indian languages, used traditional healing methods, or fought with or against Americans in various wars. They understood these traits as clear evidence of their distinct identity and took care to tell government officials about their past. The OAA dismissed such history as vague references to people who could not be positively identified as Indians and did little documentary investigation to substantiate their view. The BIA proved unwilling to abandon preconceived notions about Indian blood and listen to the information that Indian respondents did impart, a situation which may have encouraged Indians to withhold knowledge of their history and internal markers of identity. Indians attempted to conform to the OA's assumptions by declaring a percentage of Indian blood to Seltzer and his colleagues, but having never kept blood quantum records and with the overwhelming emphasis placed on kinship rather than racial ancestry, Indian calculations were hardly precise. Most Indian participants counted themselves and their spouses as one half or more than one half, regardless of whether they had any non-Indian ancestry or how much they had. One man, for example, described his calculation of blood quantum this way, to the best of my knowledge, my father and my mother were full-blood Indians and so considered themselves. I am only making claim to be three-quarter or more Indian since they may have been a lesser de de degree of which I have no knowledge. Few respondents indicated any non-Indian ancestry on their genealogy charts, which dated back five generations, like mine does. But regardless of their apparent 100% Indian ancestry, most Indians declined to claim full blood. Their reluctance may have resulted from a warning the BIA issued in the first few days of the examination. BIA officials wrote, 
There was such a unanimity of claim to one half or more Indian blood that we took occasion to point out to the Indians that such claims, when not based on reasonable grounds of belief or evidence, would prove damaging to the group as a whole, on that all claims, however sound, might be placed under suspicion. Indians, therefore, increasingly began to claim one half for themselves and their spouses, rather than more than one half or full. The OIA was unprepared to accept Robinson County Indians' notions of kinship, genealogy, and blood relationships. To them, it was historically and biologically impossible for this group to claim such a high proportion of Indian blood because genealogy was simply an unacceptable standard of proof. Furthermore, the BIA explicitly stated that if Native Americans employed their own identity criteria, the Indian office would doubt their claims and dismiss them. The agency's reliance on academic criteria for identity made it difficult for the participants to pass the OIA's test. Indians told the OIA about their culture, about the ways they determined who belonged in their community, but the Indian office believed that blood determined culture and sought to define Indians' relationships to one another by abstract principles that had nothing to do with their culture. This contradictory use of science to document their identity left Indians confused and vulnerable to ridicule from the OIA. In commenting on one Indian's miscalculation of his Indian blood, officials wrote, it will be noticed that this claimant could not write his name and the inconsistency of his calculation did not appear to impress him. Concerning another participant's confusion, they reported he attended school only three months and presumably has small, fra small knowledge of what fractions mean. Well, I have a PhD and I look at that chart that Eva gave everybody and I have no idea what it means, right? So, as Eva has pointed out, the BIA's manner of explaining and justifying their calculations of Indian blood is complicated and had an inherent social bias. The federal government explicitly created blood quantum rules to define a mixed blood, a legal and political category that determined when the federal government's responsibility to Indian people ended. The complexity of determining one's percentage of Indian blood and the irrelevance of the standard to Native people's own kinship and genealogical systems ensured two things. First, that the blood quantum criteria retained its aura of scientific objectivity, unintelligible to the uneducated and illiterate. And second, that the BIA retained the prerogative to decide who was Indian and who was not, over and above Indians' own criteria. When the OIA exerted control over the discussion of Indian identity, as it did during the Indian New Deal in Robinson County, employees used ridicule to pressure Indians into conforming to foreign notions of identity in the name of objective science. The BIA did so in order to withhold services from most of the eight to 10,000 Indians that they otherwise might have recognized in Robeson County. While Seltzer's conclusions demonstrated the contradictions the OIA might have expected from anthropometry, the tests nonetheless accomplished their purpose. Of the 209 participants, all of whom provided evidence of their Indian identity and claimed to possess one half or more Indian blood, Seltzer only found 22 that he believed passed the anthropometric test. Ms. Bedian here was borderline. Um, highlighting the imprecise nature of the tests, there she is again. Highlighting the imprecise nature of the tests and the rigid character of Seltzer's analysis, he also identified 11 individuals as borderline and seven as near borderline. One might logically presume that the full siblings of these successful participants, the more than half Indian ones, would also possess the same blood quantum, but Seltzer's analysis defies logic, as you see here. We have two full siblings, both daughters of BDM Brooks. One is one half or more Indian, the other is less than one half Indian. This is crazy. Thank you, Western Europe. Um, as absurd as these results may sound to our ears, Indians in Robeson County could not afford to ignore them. The OIA's pseudo-scientific criteria for Indian identity formed the basis for future relations between the Indian office and Robeson County Indians. The BIA had promised them a new deal, an objective policy that would not trap them in the blood politics of white supremacy. The hallmark of the Indian New Deal was the application of science to policy but the BIA's belief in anthropometry blinded them to the inconsistencies and prejudices of science. The Indian New Deal left people in Robeson County even more vulnerable to the racial prejudices and stereotypes that white supremacy dictated. 
Through using blood quantum to determine identity, John Collier's dream of self-government for Indian tribes became a way for the federal government to continue the domination and colonization of Indian peoples. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. I don't know if anybody, um, I'm going to see if we can figure out what's going on with the beeping. <laughs> but actually, you can see um, some, of the, um, some of these photos from uh, the Seltzer so-called tests are up in our Our Lives gallery on the third floor, um, just to show you can see very clearly how some of the same children from both parents um, are shown as having different blood quantum and how arbitrary that is in the um, North Carolina community. I am now honored to introduce Dr. C. Matthew Snip, who is the Burnett C. and Mildred Finley Wolford Professor of Humanities and Sciences in the Department of Sociology at Stanford University. He also has had a major impact in the development of US Census so that it may more accurately measure American Indian data. I'd also like to say that Matt has been a pathfinder for Native sociology. Um, there are actually not that many Native American sociology, sociologists. I think there's probably like four of the, I don't know how many of them here in the room, including myself, Eva, and, and Matt. So I'd like to, to thank him for those contributions as well. And he's been bringing to bear his social science expertise for the well-being of Native individuals and communities. Please let's welcome Matt Snip. Well, thank you, Gabby, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, let's see. Okay, okay there's, there's n n no bomb in the back no of the room. Okay. Good, good to know. Uh, let's see. Bear with me a second here. Okay. All right. Um, I've got a lot of slides uh, to show you here today, and I apologize that I'm going to sort of speed through a number of them. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to leave you with two points today. Uh, the first point is that the American Indian population is a very, very diverse population. It's a spectacularly diverse population. Uh, ethnically, going all the way back to the, before the arrival of Europeans and then for the past five, 500 years, it's been a biologically diverse population. And I'll, and I'll show you uh, some, some data that bears on that in a second. The second point, I think, is more subtle, but it's that uh, blood quantum uh, is, is, a, is a policy instrument that fits into a larger mission that the federal government has been engaged in since the founding of this country, and that is to solve the Indian problem by making Indians go away. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'm going to sort of take that point up first. If looking at the history of blood and blood quantum, as, as Melinda and as Eva pointed out, it's a very old idea. It's been knocking around in, in Western culture going all the way back to the Greco-Roman times. And even and within the context of the United States, uh, we've had uh, a long history of blood quantum in another context, not just for American Indians. In 1705, there was actually a law passed in Virginia uh, to define who mulattoes are in terms of blood uh, admixtures. And then in 1866, uh, the state of Virginia uh, established the one-quarter blood quantum uh, for, for Indians. Okay. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, in the documents uh, of, of the United States government, uh, there are frequent references to blood and blood ancestry with specific mention of American Indians, uh, congressional documents, uh, commission reports, correspondence. Uh, there are often, often, often uh, mentions of blood uh, quantum. But it doesn't get, uh, blood quantum does not come into uh, official use as, as a doctrine until late, uh, later in the, in the 19th century, and that the federal government takes a sort of a, a very keen and special interest in blood doc quantum towards the, the latter part of, of, of the 19th century after, after the Civil War. 
uh, but it becomes increasingly important. Uh, in the uh, late 19th century, early, early 20th century roles that were taken, blood quantum is frequently recorded. And then, as I'm going to show you in a second, uh, it actually becomes a policy device uh, in, in the 1930s. The um, intellectual pedigree of blood quantum rules is, is one that I, I think is worth having a look at because I, it should make you uncomfortable if, uh, if it doesn't already. Um, race in this country starts, starts out as a category of civil status in, in, the, uh, in, in the Constitution. It becomes racialized in the, in the 19th century. And I'd like to sort of explain how that happens just by focusing on two men, Lewis Henry Morgan and Eli S. Parker. Um, civil status and the census, and, uh, I think, sort of illustrates how you know the, how we, we think about what race was, and particularly what American Indians, the category of American Indians, was at the founding of the country. Okay, in the Constitution, you have this language, uh, specifically the issues of taxation and representation are to be settled by counting people. Okay, it's de representative democracy, and Thomas Jefferson believed very strongly that we should count people, and so. And, then he, and so the Constitution lays out the way that we're going to count people. And so we're going to, we're going to count the number of free persons, uh, including indentured persons. Uh, we're going to exclude Indians not taxed. Uh, Indians were not citizens. Okay? Again, citizenship is a category. This is, a, this is why, what makes Indian a, a category of civil status, at least in the early years of this country. And then three-fifths of all other persons, which is, of course, the sort of the notorious three-fifths compromise that counted slaves as, as six-tenths of, of a whole person. This is an important distinction. This is an important, uh, it's important to understand that Indian in the Constitution, as this country was first formed, Indian was a civil status. It was a political status. It was not about race any way, shape, or form. Certainly people had ideas about race, certainly people had ideas about blood, certainly had ideas about, you know, uh, who was black and who was Indian and who was white. But for the purposes of governance, for the purposes of organizing this country, Indians is a, is a, is a political status. Now, how'd that change? How did, how did it get racialized? Where did, how, did, how did Indian come to be not only a category of civil status, but also more importantly, especially today, uh, how did it become a racial category? Okay. Well, one way that that happened, uh, one story you can, or, or, or a narrative that you can, you can put forward about that, is to focus on these two men that I'm about to tell you about. Uh, Lewis Henry Morgan uh, was a founder of modern anthropology. Okay? Very, very influential man in his time. And Morgan made his reputation by studying the Iroquois. Okay. Uh, he was also very influential in the development of two fields, uh, ethnology, which was the study of races, and eugenics, which was the, sort of the application of that study of races. And so the idea was that you were supposed to compile all of this information about you know, the traits of different races, and then once you had those traits, then you could sort of use it in, in, in the service of society by determining who should be marrying and interbreeding with whom. Okay. And that was eugenics. And particularly, uh, this was a particularly important set of ideas because uh, in Morgan's time, and, and you know Morgan wasn't alone in this, but he was certainly an influential proponent of the idea, that inheritance was all about how behavior and culture got passed down across the generations. And so not only did you inherit your mother's eyes and your father's hair, or lack thereof, um, you also maybe, you also inherited their accent, you inherited the way they thought about the world, you may have inherited the uh, particular odd kinds of views that they have, you inherited their intelligence, you inherited their personality. All those things came into play. Okay? The inheritance of culture and behavior was a trope that dominated the social sciences and the biological sciences throughout the 19th and for even a, a good part of the 20th century. And it was this notion that, you know, that, era that you could inherit, that, that, that 
Morgan brought to the sciences is this notion that, you know, that, that all we need to do was to catalog these characteristics. So, so for the Iroquois, what Morgan did was that he, he, he listed the traits of the Iroquois, the so things like playing a drum, playing a flute, living in a longhouse, sleeping in the nude, were all characteristics that you inherited. You laugh now. This, they weren't laughing back in this gentleman's days. This is Eli S. Parker. Eli S. Parker was a remarkable man for his time. Uh, he was a Seneca Indian, uh, rose to the rank of Sachem. He was highly respected and highly regarded in his community. Uh, Eli S. Parker was also a scholar. He studied law and engineering. And after the start of the Civil War, he enlisted in the Army. And he rose to the rank of Brigadier General. Uh, he uh, also happened to be uh, Ulysses S. Grant's adjutant. Uh, he drew up the terms of surrender for Appomattox. Okay. Uh, and then when Ulysses S. Grant was elected president, uh, he appointed Parker as the first Indian Commissioner of Indian Affairs. As it happened, Eli S. Parker was also a friend and colleague of Lewis Henry Morgan. And so Morgan's ideas about the inheritance of behavior and culture and all of the other things that were so common in, okay, what happened here? Okay, I'm a demographer. I can't live without my PowerPoint. Okay, while you, while you try to figure this out, I'll, I'll talk about Elias Parker. Um, Elias Parker, as I said, was a friend, colleague of, of Morgan. In fact, there are people who believe that you know, some, of Mor uh, some of Morgan's writings were in fact not his, his work, but in fact the work of Elias Parker. And when Parker... Uh, was appointed Commissioner of Indian Affairs. He served from 1869 to 1871. And an interesting thing happened in the years beginning with Parker's tenure as the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. The, uh, the, the federal government began to take a keener and keener interest in the blood quantum and the blood mixtures of American Indians. In 1860, the census didn't even trouble to count American Indians. Uh, there was no mention of, in fact, there were instructions in the 1860 census telling enumerators that, that Indians not taxed, as so defined in the Constitution, were to be explicitly not enumerated in the 1860 census. Um, in the 1870 census, uh, there was uh, an enumeration of American Indians, including adopted whites living among American Indians. And those adopted whites were counted not as white, but as as, as, as American Indians. This, isn't all that, this wasn't all that uncommon um, in, the, in the early part of the 19th century. In fact, very often uh, tribes were, were enumerated or were identified as having some number of, of white Indians, black Indians, and red Indians. Uh, the, when the Choctaw were removed to the Indian Territory in the uh, 1830s, there were enumerated, they were enumerated and enrolled as red Choctaw, black Choctaw, and white Choctaw. So by 1860, there's no count. 1870, there's a count. And by 1880, in the 1880 census, the census began to actually take an enumeration of the numbers of, of, of the blood quantum numbers, how many, quarter, how many half breeds, how many quarter breeds there were in the population. So, you know, somehow, somehow around this time that, that of Morgan's uh, presence, uh, you began to see uh, blood quantum and, and sort of the enumeration of, of blood fractions seeping into the administration of Indian Affairs and, and federal policy. Now, all I say is that I can't, I can't say for certain that, that uh, Parker was responsible for doing this. It, it certainly happened around his time. And the reason I have to offer this disclaimer was that about 10 years ago, I was, I was sort of giving a version of this talk, talking about Parker. And in the back of the room, this very elderly woman sort of kind of raised her hand and said out very loudly, he's my grandfather. And um, so, so after I was done speaking, we had a break in this conference. Uh, you know, I had a chance to sit down and chat with this woman for, for, for quite a long time. And, um, and we talked about Parker, and she actually had written her, her uh, PhD dissertation about Parker. And uh, she, she sort of she gave me a hard time about me accusing Parker of doing this. 
And so, you know, I said, so I asked her, I said, well, you know, you've got his papers. Uh, would, you, would you just go back and see if you can find a memo or a note or any kind of thing about that, that where Parker may have issued an order while he was commissioner? And so we corresponded for, oh, about a year about this back and forth. And, um, and she said, you know, she went, you know, finally she, she sent me a note. And she said, you know, I have, I have gone through all of his papers, you know, and some of the papers, you know, even twice. And I, I couldn't find anything where, where he specifically mem- writes a memo or issues an order to begin counting blood quantum. So I have to issue that disclaimer that, you know, there is no smoking gun. Okay? Um, but be that, that, that said... Uh, moving forward in the, into the 19th century and into the 20th century, uh, the federal government assiduously records the blood quantum of, of American Indians uh, for all kinds of purposes. Uh, in, the, in the allotment enrollment, enrollments, uh, the, the Dawes Roll in Oklahoma, uh, other kinds of things, the Census Bureau and, and subsequent censuses, also it takes very care, uh, great care to enumerate uh, blood quantum. Uh, but they're not doing much with it. Until finally, in the, and if I had the PowerPoint slide, I'd, sh- I'd show you the document. But finally, in 1933, um, oh, here comes the cavalry. Um, in, in 1933, uh, the uh, report, and actually you can, you can go and look this up if you have access to the government do- uh, documents depository. Uh, in 1933, there, there, there was the report for the commissioner's, uh, commissioner's report for, for Indian Affairs was, was published as it is for every year or was every year. And this was for the fiscal year of, of, of 1932. And the language of this document says that there are too many of these low blood quantum Indians out there. We've got a lot of low, quantum, blood, low blood quantum Indians who are collecting benefits. It's costing the government a lot of money. And what we have to do is that we have to institute and implement a new policy that limits the number of Indians out there and particularly what we want to do is we want to set a minimum standard of, of blood quantum. And what we're going to do is we propose that the blood quantum be one quarter blood. And the commissioners of Indian Affairs all raised their hands, sat around the table, took a vote. And one quarter blood quantum became the law of the land for who was and was not an Indian. Okay. And that I have the smoking gun for. Okay. In 1934, as Melinda mentioned, we have the Indian Reorganization Act. And the Indian, Indian Reorganization Act says that any tribe can have a, can have a tribal government on, uh, with the proviso that it has to look like the United States government, that is, it has to be a representative democracy with at least an executive branch and a, uh, a legislative branch. And that it should have some sort of, all of these tribes had to adopt constitutions. And in the course of adopting constitutions, of course, the, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs people went out uh, and, and took constitutions with them, the hand of the constitution, said, okay, here's, what a, here's this boilerplate constitution, you can use this as a model. And what most tribes did was that they pretty much adopted them uh, without revision. And these documents had the requirement that to be a tribal member, you had to be one quarter blood quantum. And so we have now blood quantum established as the law of the land and establishing as a matter of federal policy that you have to be one quarter blood quantum to, rece- to be recognized as an official Indian. Okay. You know, not, not, not one fraction less than one quarter. It has to be one quarter or more. Um, this is a policy that, that moves forward from 1934 um, right up to the present. Okay. There are still tribes that have blood quantum rules, lots of tribes that have blood quantum rules. And this is where it comes from. And this is why it exists. Um, some tribes have said, well, this doesn't make much sense, sort of thinking back to you know, Lewis Henry Morgan and, and some of the ideas that go along with blood quantum. Uh, and so they got rid of it. Some tribes actually have increased their blood quantums over time. Uh, and lots of tribes argue and anguish over this. Because as I'm going to show you in a second, that, as I said, the Indian population has been ethnically diverse forever, and for the fi- last 500 years, biologically diverse. And what I would like to show you, if this gentleman is successful, uh, is that it's, it's in, all, in all likelihood going to become more diverse. But the genius of blood quantum, you know, to the extent that we get rid of Indians, 
uh, as, as if, that's the, if that's the stated policy goal, is the genius of blood quantum is that it will get rid of Indians. It's getting rid of lots of Indians today. Uh, and probably will get rid of even more tomorrow. And so, how are we doing here? Okay. okay. <laughs> We're booting the computer up. Um, well, I've got, these, I've got these bar graphs, and I've got charts that go this way and that way. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gabby. Uh, but what the charts are going to show you, uh, and I've got actually, they're, I'm probably going to use up all my time here too. Uh, what these charts, if I could show them, would show you is that the Indian population has been very diverse going back, you know, it, it's, numbers, the only numbers, really good numbers we have really kind of go back to the early part of this century or the 20th century. Uh, and, but, you know, we do population projections as demographers, you know, you can see what's happening. You can see what's happening in census data. And then what I'd also like to show you too with census data uh, is, is actually some, some actually very surprising findings that, that pop out of the census if you know how, if you know how and where to look. So with, with that said, oops. well, it's working up here, I can tell. Maybe I could just hold the computer up for it. Okay. Yay. You're clapping, I'm jumping for joy. Okay. <laughs> Actually, let me, I'll, I'll back up. Let me just back up. Um, um, you know, it just, if you want to show, if you, if you, if you don't, if you ever doubted in just how pervasive uh, Indian blood is in, in Indian communities, this is an ad that comes out of the Cherokee Phoenix. It was uh, run May 2004. Uh, so, you know, what you do is you, you go down to the Lincoln Mercury dealer in Tulsa, uh, negotiate your best deal, then they'll knock off another $500 off your Lent Navigator uh, if you have your CDIB card. All right, I'm going to skip through this. Uh, this, is, this is just the, the census question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm so, sorry. Okay. I think we're technically appropriate now. All right. Um, what I want to show you is that, you know, the American Indian population has been growing very dramatically. Uh, this shows the growth in the population from uh, 1890 when it hit its lowest point at about 250,000. Uh, and the population has continued to grow. Um, really, it was flat uh, through the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and that uh, it's, there was a spectacular growth that takes place in the second half of the 20th century. Right? Now, we know that Indians, and I'm going to show you in a second, had a very high fertility rate, so this flat population growth doesn't make any sense. This means basically the same number of people are born as dying. It's true that they had a high mortality rate, but this, this number, sh this should have been going up like that. Uh, but instead it's flat. But somehow we make up for it at the end of the century. Right? Um, this is, okay, I'm having the same problem Eva had here. Okay, um, so this is, this is just based on, on updated numbers from 2010. Uh, now this is uh, actually fertility rates going back to uh, 1910 for women aged 25 to 64. You can see that, in fact, uh, mixed bloods had the highest fertility rates, 5.29 5 children. Uh, compared to four and a half children for, for full blood uh, relationships. Uh, and as it turned out, um, full blood whites actually had the most children. Okay, um, this again, this is just changes in fertility rates over time. Um, you can see that the, the, this is the rate, was, well, these, this is based on that previous graph. Uh, and then it dripped down around 1940, 1950, and then it started to pick up again around 1960. Okay. Uh, American Indians, this is another important point to do, is telling you keep them to think about, you know, where does the mixed race uh, Indian population come from? One of the things that has happened that's been very dramatic since World War II is an increase in the number of American Indians living in cities. And so this is the number, this is the percent of American Indians in cities in, in 1980, went up a little in 1990. 
Uh, 2,000 it jumped up a lot, but it's because you had uh, a large number of people who identified themselves as American Indian and white or black or white and black or some combination thereof uh, who concentrated in cities, as it turns out, and who actually have a, a very different kind of profile than the folks who tend to identify themselves as American Indian alone in the census. Um, this is the numbers, or I should say the percent of American Indians and Alaska Natives who are married to non-Natives. And you can see that this went, you know, it was below 50% in 1970. Uh, the blue is for women, the men is, uh, green is for men. Uh, men have slightly lower outmarriage rates. Uh, jumped up in 1980, 1990, and then it went down, we're not quite sure why, down in 2000. Uh, but, you know, in 1990 and, 19, and, and 2000, uh, if, you happen to be Ameri if you happen to be American Indian, uh, it was more likely that you were married to a non-Indian than to another Indian. Right. And this is just the uh, fertility rates uh, recently, and you can see that in recent years, the American Indian fertility rate uh, has actually uh, been pretty close to the uh, white rate. Okay. Um, this is actually sort of the change in the American Indian uh, population. Uh, you know, people who identified as American Indian alone are the top. That population between 2000 and 2010 increased only about 9%, which is about what you might expect from births and deaths. Uh, but the population, the, the, what you might think of as the mixed identity um, or mixed heritage population increased about 24%. These are American Indians and whites. Uh, African Americans had increased 42%, which is very dramatic. Um, white African and white and African American and Arab American Indian people, uh, that population doubled. And so you can see the, the increase in the number of people who have American Indian heritage and, and are choosing to disclose it. Okay, and I'm just going to skip on through these tables. Okay. Now these next tables are, are, are projections. This is a table of... Uh, uh, their population projections, and this is a table showing the growth in the, the, the population with more than one half blood quantum. So you can see it's going to increase and then probably decline. Uh, and then you can see what happens to the people with less than quarter blood quantum right there. Uh, this is another projection uh, which just shows the, this is com contrasting people who identify only as American Indian, the American Indian alone population being more or less flat through the 21st century. And you can see this is what's happening to the, or the expected to happen to the population uh, who identify as American Indian and, and, and something else. And this is a Census Bureau projection. This shows the growth in the American Indian population alone who identify only as American Indian, and this is the in combination population. Uh, up through 2050. Now, population projections are just that. They're just projections. They're just, you know, possible uh, outcomes given certain kinds of assumptions. Uh, but there are also some very challenging anomalies that you can find in the data. So you can look at, this is actually the, the enrolled and, and service population for uh, American Indians. This comes from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And this is the numbers of people, you know, the change between 95 and 2005. Uh, in the service popular, or in the service, or excuse me, this is the numbers enrolled, and that's the number of people who are actually receiving services. So they track pretty closely, okay? They don't track very well with the census at all, okay? This is the numbers of enrolled, that's based on that previous graph. This is the numbers of people who identify only as American Indian, and you see there's a, there's a, there's a discon disconnect between those two, and then this is the alone or in combination. So many, many, many more people who identify as American Indian than, than who are actually enrolled. Okay. Uh, we always think of tribe as being sort of a benchmark, or you know, sort of marker of, 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 of who's an Indian, who isn't. Uh, in 1980, you had about 22% of the population that didn't report a tribe. Census Bureau in 1990 had a very, very aggressive campaign asking people to report their tribe, and indeed the numbers went down, more people reported their tribe went back up in 2000. No advertising campaign. Okay. Um, numbers of foreign-born American Indians. I mean, foreign-born American Indians, that's almost an oxymoron, right? Where where'd these people come from? Uh, well, you can see that uh, in 2000 that there were about 120,000 uh, 
uh, foreign-born American Indians who identified only as American Indian. Uh, and a number, another number, uh, about 100,000 who identified uh, American Indian and white or American Indian and black or something else. And uh, about 5.4% of American Indian population, whether it's this in combination group or this alone group, uh, about 5% uh, are foreign born. Now, where do those people come from? Well, most of them we think probably came from uh, uh, Latin America or, or Mexico, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, this is just shows the year of entry. You can see that uh, these foreign born American Indians, um, at least the ones who identify only as American Indian, they, they were for, they came into the country probably before, you know, more in the period of 65 to 95. Right? Uh, fewer, in, fewer, almost none, or very small percentage of before 65, and a smaller percentage uh, after uh, 95. Right. And indeed, uh, the Hispanic and non-Hispanic population, the Hispanic population, or the component of, of the American Indian population that identifies as Hispanic, has increased. So in 1990, uh, that green are the Hispanics. Uh, that number just about doubled between 1990 and 2000. And then if you focus on the people who identify uh, in combination or with some other race, then that's an, it's, it's even larger. Okay. And so it's the, these foreign born and, and a lot of people coming into the country uh, are indigenous. Right. So my, my final point is that, uh, you know, I hope I persuaded you of at least you're giving you a hint of the sort of the stunning diversity of the American Indian Alaska Native population. And then I also want to, as I said, wanted to make the point that uh, blood quantum uh, has, a, has, a, has a dubious history. And sort of, and sort of def uh, so my, my last comment is that, you know, of course, you know, blood quantum does matter. It matters a great deal to a, a lot of people in this country. I think the question that uh, Native people need to engage is whether it should matter. Bravo. <laughs> really want to give an extra thank you um, to Matt. It was really quite amazing. Okay. So I guess we're going to have some technical turnover here. Okay. All right. Oh, I see. Okay, just bear with us for another minute. We have a very illustrious speaker on our way. All right. Can I go ahead and do the introduction? Okay. So finally, I am so pleased to introduce Dr. Kimberly Tallbear. Kim is Assistant Professor of Science, Technology, and Environmental Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Kim's areas of inquiry into genetics and culture are so cutting edge and innovative, especially on the issues surrounding DNA and identity, that the, con the current exhibits here, you can quiet down a bit. The current exhibits here um, in the museum, especially our lives on identity, we didn't even uh, entertain the notion of DNA. I think that if uh, the exhibits had opened a year later, uh, we certainly would have been calling uh, Kim. We would have been talking to other people who are looking into DNA. And of course, there's been a great upsurge of people looking into this matter individually. And it's starting to uh, and has been increasing in conversation with uh, tribes, with policy questions about it, people uh, self-seeking. But what does that mean? What does that actually mean? So I would like to uh, welcome Kim to the stage, and hopefully we will have all of our technical work up, lined up, quiet, so we can give her our full attention. Thank you. Okay. I put the mic up because I'm tall. It's always too short, but it's, is it on? It doesn't sound good. Okay. Maybe that's just a good mic. Um, let's see. Yeah, there we go. My television popped on at 4 a.m. this morning, and I jumped up and ran up to the TV, and then it turned off. So I'm afraid all this technology stuff is some uh, little bad spirit following me around. And I was thinking when that happened, 
I'm a fan of Asian horror movies, that film Ringu, and I thought some evil Japanese girl's gonna jump out of that TV. I could not go back to sleep. I was terrified. I'm not kidding. I just started. <laughs> so I don't know. And if there are technological problems for here on out, we will just leave the bad spirits to themselves, and I will I will go forward. Um, let's see. If I, but the technology you can do something about, I ban cell phones from my classroom. If your cell phone is on, please turn it off. It is so distracting to the speaker. I'd really appreciate it. Okay. Um, so I, I have a lot of ground to cover in, I don't quite have 20 minutes, but so I may go a minute over, but I've got a lot of ground to cover. I'm just gonna jump into it. Okay. Um, the speakers before me have talked a lot about uh, Indian blood, and that's a really important foundation for what I want to talk about, and they, they covered the ground really well, and I actually thought, I thought about this topic a lot, but I've learned a lot from them. Um, two key phenomena to keep in mind to understand not only the concept of Indian blood, and whenever we say that, I think, in the scholarly world, we always think in terms of scare quotes, but also the more recent phenomenon of Native American DNA. And I think about that in scare quotes, but I'm not going to do that uh, every time I say it. So. You need to understand both of those things in concert with one another to understand what I'm going to talk about today. So um, there, are, there are two pieces of that I want to address in this talk in the next uh, 18 to 20 minutes. First is federal Indian law and concepts of sovereignty. You've gotten some of that, and I don't go into that in detail. I'm not a lawyer, but keep that in the front of your mind. Um, the second is concepts of race in the United States that have to do with pr the particular U.S. history of colonization and development. Within that history of colonization, the black-white race binary has come to dominate. The majority of race scholars in this country really disproportionately treat the black-white binary. We have to ask then, there's a scholar from Stan, a graduate of Stanford named Yael Ben Zvi who wrote a very nice article a few years ago called What Happened to Red? Um, she looks at what happened to Red in the sort of solidification of the black-white binary. And if you look at all of the most influential race scholarship in this country, Native American race is sorely under-theorized. That's changing now. There's a lot of new scholars coming up through the pipeline who are treating race in a complex way. And when I say a complex way, we need to think about histories of race, but we also need to think about hi histories of law and treaties and how these things are working in tandem. And I think we'll get to some of that in the Q&A if, if uh, anybody can stay. So the big questions I'll address in the next 18 minutes are what is similar and different between blood and DNA? both symbolically and in terms of what we think of, in terms of how we think about who's Native American. Second, again, how are these two objects linked together in the racialized history of development and expansion in the United States? Both blood and DNA have been and continue to be scientific objects, so objects of scientific inquiry. How have these two things emerged in tandem and our discussions about them within U.S. colonial history? The first person I want to mention, a very influential uh, legal scholar uh, in uh, race and law, that's Cheryl Harris out at UCLA. She wrote a very influential uh, law review article published in 1993 in the Harvard Law Review called Whiteness as Property. It took me all summer la last year to get through this article. I'm not a lawyer. I have distilled it into three basic points that I think are important for the, the talk that I want to give. Harris makes an interesting argument. She describes the race category of whiteness as a form of property that has enabled those who were able to identify as belonging to that category to in turn control other forms of property. So the, basic, the three basics of her argument, first, that racial theories that were prominent during the developing years of the U.S., and Matt alluded to this with um, Lewis Henry Morgan, these theories positioned whites as rational agents who were alone capable of transforming nature into productive property. Native peoples, on the other hand, were seen as existing outside of or at an earlier point, point in civilizational time. As such, they lacked the moral qualities needed to advance civilization by transforming natural resources into things of value. This justified the taking of their lands or, for blacks, the appropriation of their bodies and labor. Second, Harris argued that whiteness and property became so strongly linked that whiteness in effect became a form of treasured property that accords those who own it rights and privileges that the American legal system has continued to defend. Third, these privileges also include, and this is what we're talking about today, the right to control the legal meaning of group identity. For if the privileges of whiteness were going to be reserved for a few, Blacks and Native Americans, for example, had to be racialized and subordinated as other in order to give whites, or Americans as Morgan called them, 
the exclusive right to appropriate natural resources, including slave bodies and labor, again, for the development of the U.S. nation. It's a really important article, very helpful to me. I also need to credit my co-author. We've got a paper coming out um, on the, the, the topic, that, the talk that I'm giving today. Uh, Jenny Reardon, she's a sociologist at UC Santa Cruz. Um, this paper's coming out in Current Anthropology this winter. I can't remember what it's called. Gen Genomics and Whiteness as Property, something like that. So, <clears throat> how does whiteness as property influence how we think about Native American DNA? Cheryl Harris, Harris helps us analyze the links between whiteness and property in the biosciences. So that's what Jenny and I do. We take this legal scholarship and we say, okay, what does this mean for our analyses in the biosciences? So the biosciences have come to the fore of our nation's development strategies today. I begin my semester showing my undergraduate student President Obama's uh, inaugural address. Look how central science has come, become to governance. Science and the state are wed, in part because we have made a decision in U.S. history to separate church and state. A reaction to the kinds of religious atrocities that were happening in Europe, but that separation of church and state is uh, not a perspective that I think everybody agrees with. And what has happened is that it has allowed science to come in and take the place of the church and in really undemocratic ways, actually. So we're, we're stuck with some of the same problems. Anyway, um, that's, that's a bit of a tangent. So, but what I'm really interested in is, is how the sciences have come to the fore of our, our governance and development strategies and then what this means. So first, it is resulting in a change in the racial category of whiteness, Jenny Reardon and I argue. So uh, self-identified Europeans, and you'll meet one of these uh, self-identified Europeans shortly, argue for access to nature in the form of indigenous DNA because they can transform it into something of value and use. That value is finding their origins, ending racism, we get genetics as part of this sort of multicultural, we're all related, we're all from Africa, therefore genetics is going to end racism. Uh, we can perhaps, if we are sampling indigenous and other remotely located people, find cures eventually for diseases. So, so the biosciences are claiming that they have the right to these materials because they can transform them into something productive and useful. You're seeing uh, this painting, American Progress, from the 19th century. Listen as I go through this slide, the similarity between discourses of uh, the moral authority to appropriate land and natural resources in the 19th century and the moral authority to appropriate DNA in the 21st century. These kinds of claims imply older conceptualization of indigenes as the sources of natural resources Again, this time, not our lands, but our bodies as DNA repositories. And remember that we are perceived and often portrayed as having no similar capacity to transform biological resources into things of value. So we tend to get portrayed as anti-science. Now, whiteness, th that race category, is still associated with Europe, but it has always been about rationality and modernity. So whiteness is now, we argue, enacted through the subjectivity of the scientist, basically that science now shares in the privileges of whiteness and helps reproduce them. Whiteness in this scientific form still figures as the rational civilizing project that creates symbolic and material value of all use to humanity. So to use Harris's analysis, whiteness itself is a thing of value that should be developed and defended with indigenous natural resources essential to the developmental quest, but you have to think about whiteness as now being tightly aligned with the, with, with the scientist's subjectivity which means that people who might consider themselves non-white also have access to some of these privileges of whiteness. Um, and there are plenty of uh, uh, non-white scientists working on this stuff. So red as the property of whiteness, several, several quick points. Legal concepts of property and anthropological concepts of human evolution are concerned with, they, they have this in common, connecting individuals or generations within particular groups in order to facilitate the transfer of material and biological properties from the deceased to living members of the same group. So both the law and anthropology are concerned with this idea of inheritance. How that happens, who should inherit, who does inherit. Both fields have used race and the speakers before me showed this already, as a conceptual tool to order humans into groups in order to facilitate or understand the, the transfer of property within group. We want to transfer property within group. It's what we're concerned about. So through both legal and anthropological discourses of inheritance, you see the privilege then of certain racial groups stabilized. Hierarchies uh, that are social and political in nature are made to seem 
natural. Let me give you a really interesting example that really struck me for those of you that have seen the race exhibit. You remember that one where you've got the stacks of dollars, white people, stacks of dollars, blacks down here, Latinos probably even lower, Native Americans really low. It's a, it's a very striking display. What I saw when I saw that stack of white dollars was, excuse me, slavery, theft of land. This isn't about uh, somebody of, some person of color having a lower IQ and just not working harder, the problem of the absence of the black father in the black American family. You see that history in those stacks of dollars. And so uh, this, is, this is what uh, this concept of property helps stabilize. It makes these hierarchies and these inequalities seem very natural. And we have scientists who are still really interested in uh, looking at questions of IQ and the problem of, you know, the lack of the, the father and the family of color in the U.S. So... Okay. Red in the 19th century racial imaginary. This is, this is a, a little bit of important history, and again, I think uh, the, the other speakers have already alluded to this. Red gets absorbed into the white body politic in order to solidify the black-white binary in nation building. So again, in the interest of appropriating land, of disenfranchising blacks, uh, of adjusting immigration to shifting race strategies, uh, Matt showed us how red or Native American race came to be understood through cultural evolutionism. Did you go through that, that slide? Lewis Henry Morgan had this theory of cultural evolutionism where you had... Uh, and I've got it on the bottom there, you know, the, the, the African is, is the savage, he's just above the ape, and then you get uh, barbarism, that's the middle uh, level of cult, human cultural evolution, and then you get up to the top, what is that guy, Greek or Roman, I don't know, but he's civilized. He's got a nice, you know, flat face, he doesn't have these bad angles like Linda was, or Melinda was talking about. So this was Lewis Henry Morgan's theory. Um, what he posited was that Red people evolutionarily preceded whites, but they had evolved more than Africans and were capable of evolving more than Africans. What happened then was that because they were, they, they had maybe their, their evolutionary development had been arrested with the arrival of the white man, there were claims then made to sort of take the Native American sort of cultural past and biological and material past into the white body, into the white nation. So Aboriginal history, culture, and land became the patrimony of whites. And you can see the kinds of things that Lewis Henry Morgan wrote on the slide here. Um, he actually studied Native American homes in the Southwest and looked at, looked at some of the bricks and said, oh, these are cruder forms of the kinds of bricks that, that Americans, meaning white people, used. And so was, was doing this kind of work showing the cultural similarities and, and then able to justify the, the, uh, the uh, absorption of Native Americans into the white body. So you can read along, since mankind were one in origin, their career has been essentially one, running in different but uniform channels upon all continents, and very similarly in all tribes and nations of mankind down to the same status of advancement. It follows that the history and experience of the American Indian tribe represent more or less nearly the history of our own remote ancestors when in corresponding conditions. I'm gonna... Um, quickly go through these next few slides because I want to get to the, the end of my talk, but my basic point is that these 19th century racial imaginaries persist in 21st century genetics. So geneticists are seeking to sample very special people um, uh, in, in tracing our origin. So th this will sort of uh, prepare you for, for a next slide. One of the things that they're interested, when they talk about our origins, you've got a self-identified European here, and this is Spencer Wells. He works for uh, National Geographic, um, is principal investigator of the Genographic Project, uh, has said on film, has described himself on film as, as, a, as a European, and science is one of their ways of, uh, of tracing their origins. So again, Europeans have science, the rest do not. He talks about these as European song lines. This is from a PBS film in 2003, uh, Journey of Man. Um, he's speaking to an Aboriginal artist here. You know, the Aboriginal artist is dubious about the, the uh, out of Africa um, uh, narrative of human origins. And you see those migration patterns that, that geneticists have demonstrated, you know, um, not, not, a, not a good overview, but you see those migration patterns around the world out of Africa. So this is the narrative that Spencer Wells is telling. The Aboriginal artist is, is a little dubious about this because for him, his people emerged out of that place in Australia. Um, 
What's really interesting and why I show you this slide is because, again, Spencer Wells is making a claim that science is the way of Europeans to trace their origins. He says, you guys don't need that, right? You've got your traditional narratives. You've got a sense of direct continuity. But we need this science, and we need, by the way, your DNA if we are going to reconstruct our origins. So property claims. Other kinds of property claims going on. This is the very famous Havasupai case. Um, that happened in Arizona. Uh, the principal investigator, Therese Markow, there on the left, uh, never, even after the Havasupai, were, were seriously distressed about the, the misrepresentation of, of this research to them. They, the, the investigators from Arizona State were supposed to go in and do diabetes research. They were applying for grants to do schizophrenia research, which also involves uh, researching consanguinity or inbreeding, so the multiple levels of stigmatization here. The tribe finds out about it because Carletta Toulouse was a graduate student at ASU, happened to go to a dissertation defense and saw what was being presented. Um, th there were two lawsuits filed. Throughout all of this, it dragged on for years. It was really, an, it was an egregious case. Um, Professor Markow never ever once said, I'm sorry, even it was a misunderstanding. She continued to defend her position throughout. And one of the things she said is knowledge is power. The more one knows, the better off one is from a research perspective. So the desire to acquire knowledge trumps other sorts of ethical decisions. Gabby, how much time? Seven minutes, OK. So I just want to mention an another uh, legal article. This is not the museum director, Kevin Gover, but this is a woman named Kirsty Gover who wrote this article, a young woman from New Zealand um, who, for I don't know what reason, came to law school in the United States and just wrote a fantastic article about the transition from Indian blood uh, as sort of a monolithic kind of racial entity to this notion of tribal blood uh, in the 20th century. And she does this a survey of three, over 300 tribal constitutions in the 20th century and looks at this move from what she would call a, a monolithic racial category of Indian blood within tribal enrollment to this notion of a genealogical category of tribal blood. And it's a lot to get through, but I'll just give you, give you some of the highlights that I think we need to think about um, in terms of complicating our view of what Indian blood means uh, to, to Native people in the, in the 20th century. So before 1940, the majority of tribes were using this notion of Indian blood in their uh, enrollment criteria not tribe-specific blood, just Indian blood. You can see this, actually. My own great-grandmother was enrolled at the flanders Santee Sioux Tribe in 1941. Um, even though she was from the Turtle Mountain Chippewa, had no Santee or Dakota blood at all. They enrolled her because she married my great-grandfather. That was really common for tribes at that period. Uh, so they would enroll through marriage. But they would not have enrolled her if she weren't native at all. So again, that, that's an example of Indian blood mattering, not tribal blood. Today, 70% of tribal constitutions use blood quantum uh, for membership, um, with 40% still using Indian blood. But what Kirsty Gover has found is that tribes are increasingly adopting tribe-specific blood rules. So they may want one quarter Indian blood, but they want uh, uh, they want a trace to a base role that's about that particular tribe. And some are even moving more towards looking at um, counting blood quantum according to a particular tribe. And so what she's, what, 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 what she's finding is that there's actually a move away from a race category to a genealogical or tribal category. Now, we can have an argument about whether tribe is actually another form of race, but, but she's, she's noting the difference in the 20th century. The other thing she's noting is that these changes have been prompted by political economic conditions. So you had uh, termination in the 1950s, you had relocation, you had World War II and shifting demographics. You had a lot of people moving off reservation. The majority of Indians pre-World War II were reservation. The, the, the majority post-World War II have come to be urban. And so what happens is she's arguing that tribes have instituted different kinds of blood rules in order to repair that discontinuity because people were moving in mass off reservations. You can't have residency and adoption anymore in the same way and still maintain your numbers. So it's an interesting article. I'd encourage you to read it if you're, if you're interested in this stuff, although getting through these law review articles is tedious for most of us. Um, so that, that was my main point with, with Kirsty Gover's work. Uh, how do try, now we're getting to DNA, which is my main topic, and I intended to get to this sooner. So how are tribes using DNA and enrollment? They're not doing this. Um, 
Many of you will be familiar with these genetic ancestry tests that are sold online. National Geographic Genographic is one of the main purveyors of these, but you've got companies like Family Tree, uh, Family Tree DNA, Gene Tree. Uh, basically, academic research getting commercialized. So people, geneticists and anthropologists who have been looking at uh, human migrations, tracing ancient human migrations, looking at which populations in the world are most closely related to which other populations, have been able to commercialize these technologies and data in the form of genetic ancestry tests. You can send in your swab, looks like a Q-tip, you brush the inside of your cheek, send it to a lab a few weeks later, a couple months later, they'll send you back a certificate saying one of three things, depending on what kind of test you get. Your uh, mitochondrial DNA, your mother's 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 line, it comes from this particular haplogroup in the world, and then you're, that's where your female line's descended from. If you're a man or you're a woman who can get your brother's uh, DNA, they can say your Y chromosome, your male lineage is descended from this part of the world. Or they can give you a test back that looks at a, a different kind of markers. Um, uh, nuclear DNA, autosomal markers, that will, th those are the tests that are giving you the percentages. So I'm 58% European and 30 some percent Asian, different kinds of tests. All of that, I can't treat it in detail, um, is, is, is coming out of uh, academic research um, and is being sold to you, the consumer. This is not what tribes are using, and even some tribes who use DNA testing tend to get confused about the types of tests that they're using. This is what they are using. You're seeing tribes increasingly moving to using the DNA profile. Many of us know that as a parentage test. You can now buy those online and in drugstores. Um, these are marketed to tribes explicitly for enrollment. They tend to be used in conjunction with blood rules. So say you need a father's documentation, it's usually fatherhood that's in question, to, invo to uh, substantiate your child's blood quantum. You need his documentation. He's denying he's the father or something like that. You can use one of these tests to say, okay, yeah, that's the biological father. Now we can use his documentation to enroll this child. Um, this is, again, commonly known as a paternity test. This is also uh, what's used in criminal cases to tie, say, a, a body fluid found at a crime scene to a victim or a, or a perpetrator. Okay, is that clear, the difference between those? You've got genetic ancestry on the one hand, you've got the DNA profile on the other. Tribes are only using the DNA profile test. Here's what I worry about with this. How many minutes, Gabby? Five. <laughs> She's stretching out my time. Um, some tribes use these on a case-by-case -case basis. The tribe where I'm enrolled, the Sisseton Wapaton Oyate, does this. So again, in conjunction with blood quantum, if paternity's in question, we'll do a DNA test. Other tribes, Increasingly small, wealthy tribes who are concerned about large pots of money being distributed among a, a fewer number of people are moving to across the membership testing. Um, I, ha I don't do research on this topic because I actually am not going to, well, we, that, that's neither here, but I, I don't do the research on this. So I'm getting this from just speaking at tribal enrollment conferences and things like that. It's kind of anec anecdotal. The, one, the, the, the tribes I've met that are doing this um, tend to have contentious enrollment issues um, due to the distribution of financial dividends and, and then across the membership testing comes in. Now, what you need to know is that in any community, regardless of race, class, or wherever in the world, there's going to be a level of false biological parentage. So for example, in this audience, maybe one out of 10 of us does not have the biological father we think we have. And if we go <laughs> and do a DNA test on everybody in here, you're gonna find that. Now imagine if you come into a tribal community and you've got most people whose parentage isn't in question and you do a DNA test like this, you're going to create some serious problems for people's sense of kinship and history. Um, my own tribe, again, which I find so decolonized, and they don't advertise this, and they may not want me advertising it, but they have an alternative to a DNA test. You can use a DNA test if, if parentage in, is in question, or you can go to the father's family and get three people of his relatives to sign an affidavit saying that child is our child, and, and we, we claim that child. So you can use science, or you can use a more quote-unquote traditional form of kinship. So there are, there are other possibilities out there. I haven't heard of any tribe besides mine doing that. These are just some images, flyers distributed at the National Congress of American Indians by Orchid Selmark. They're one of the main purveyors, or they were, I think they just got bought out by somebody else. It's hard to keep up with these companies. They're always, they're like banks, they're getting bought out and sold out. Um, but this is the kind of stuff they're advertising. Very phenotypically, you know, stereotypical kind of native people. There's no racial ambiguity here. <clears throat> 
One of the things I wanted to say, though, if this will, fast, if this will forward to the next slide, is I worry about tribal governments replacing blood metaphors with gene metaphors. And we've heard a lot today about the problems with blood quantum, and I completely agree with all that. But we have been dealing with blood quantum for, what, 100 years? DNA, to me, could potentially be more problematic. We have seen a shift in the, in the, the American public consciousness from blood metaphors to gene metaphors already post-1995 about, I've noticed, in popular culture. We don't talk about blood and bad blood anymore. Look at all our horror films. They're about viruses, and scientists are both the problem and they're the savior. You know, vampires and zombies now have a genetic disease or a, a mutation. It's not, there's no priests coming to save us anymore. There's no demons involved in any of this. It's, it's, it's genetic. Indians are a little bit behind the times. We haven't quite moved into the gene metaphors in quite the same way, in fact, because blood quantum is so prominent in, in our thinking. And also, I think, because we're still talking about spiritual aspects of blood, as, as Eva alluded to, and I, I appreciate that, actually. Maybe that's something we can talk more about. Um, one of the other things I wanted to say is that I, when I talk to people out in Indian country ab about these issues, I've, I've been trying to force myself to say, what exactly do you mean when you talk about blood? What ex are you talking about the physiological red substance that comes out of your veins that gets transfused? Are you talking about it in some other way? And I've also seen people coming to talk about it in these really seemingly contradictory ways that can't always be gauged by scientific discourse. One of the things that, that, that comes out is that blood quantum tends to get, in a very imprecise way, equated with counting ancestors. And the idea being that if you have more ancestors that are within the tribe or some other tribe, there's a higher probability that you're culturally affiliated. I think that's one of the reasons people hang on to it. We haven't found a better way to do these things yet. I don't know what that better way is, but it's not genetic testing. That's because I think that centering genetics may risk the foundations of tribal governance. Science, genetic science has a tremendous amount of power, and if we, we are really able to sit here and engage in this big critique and debate about blood quantum, we're all laughing at those blood quantum charts, we're calling it pseudoscience. You don't do that with DNA. It's, it has a lot more intellectual and cultural authority in our society. If we begin to think that using DNA in enrollment makes it into a rigorous scientific identity, that, that's what I get concerned about. As genetic concepts come to influ uh, influence enrollment and identity, I, I worry that we risk erasing our memory of those treaties, laws, and obligations that are foundational to tribal sovereignty. We begin to transform what it is to be Native American into this genetic thing when we have all this paperwork and these statistics and these numbers to back it up that people aren't going to laugh at in the way that we laugh at these blood quantum charts. So the final thing, and this is the context of everything that I do, I actually get so tired of talking about Native American identity. I'm really concerned with who's a subject and who's an object. So who gets to be a knowing inquirer? Who has agency, intellectual agency? Who gets to sit at the policymaking table? And who's always an object of inquiry? Who gets to be an object of resource extraction, of development, of civilization? Who gets categorized and who gets to do the categorizing? Who gets regulated versus who gets to regulate? Who gets researched? Who gets to be the object of somebody's desire to belong or to find their origins? And so I want to leave you with the words of the, uh, really, <laughs> the great Aretha Franklin. <laughs> this song sums it up. Who's zooming who? So layperson's terms for what I'm getting at. So, so again, that, that's my broader context in, in coming to this topic. And um, thank you for your attention. All right, I'd like to thank everyone. We're now going to, um, going to invite our speakers up to the stage. We're going to have some time for q and I know because of the technical glitches, uh, we might run a over a bit, but I, I do want to, well, we're supposed to end at 4.30, but we may be able to go over um, more time, so we have more time to talk. So if you have questions, please come up to the microphone so that people from our webcast can hear what you have to say.
Okay. Fire away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a question that any or all of the uh, uh, panelists might like to uh, respond to. Um, what is your perspective on the historical relationship uh, between uh, black racialization and categorization and this, uh, you know, the quantum theory, the quantum blood, and the cat racial cat categorization of uh, Native Americans? What was, what, was, what was the relationship? Is this on? Yeah, yeah. okay. What was the relationship between the way uh, African Americans have been categorized versus the way American Indians have been categorized? I mean, if you think about it, the, whole, the principle of the one drop rule or hypo descent uh, was, in a sense, invented uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War. And it became a, a, a device, in a sense, for enlarging the number of people who were subservient and, and subordinate to a particular elite white population. Uh, it expanded the pool of people who were to work as maids, servants, uh, manual laborers, uh, and at the same time, it also installed and, and it, it hardened the color line by, by creating a specific penalty for people who dared to cross the color line. Uh, so, you know, in a sense, it, it has a very sort of material uh, basis with regard to the way it plays out for African Americans. Just the opposite was true for American Indians. Uh, the sort of the, the one quarter blood quantum rule gets, cut, gets, gets put into place because it's costing the federal government too much money. And so to contain those costs, you, you limit the number of people who have access to those resources. And I think it's, um, is this on? I, I think it's um, particularly interesting that in the history of this country, we have a situation where people can be forced uh, to classify themselves as black, even if they don't want to, even if they have very distant black ancestry, they can be forced into that category. Um, whereas uh, to be able to establish yourself as an Indian person, you may have to jump through quite a few hoops and prove that you have a great deal of ancestry in order to be allowed into that uh, category. And I always ask my students to think about the question, um, about why that might be, and I, I asked them, well, think about historically in what way were black people useful to the larger, to the dominant culture? And they will usually get around to saying because of their labor, so that it makes sense that you would want to be able to define as many black people as you can as black. And then I say, well, why was it that historically Native people have been useful to the dominant society. And eventually they will get around to saying, well, because of their land. And given that, it is then in the interests of the larger culture for there to be as few people with a claim on the land um, as, as, as possible. And so that is one way to think about why is it that you have to be only historically a very little bit black in order to be forced into that category, but boy, you better be an awful lot Indian to be allowed entry into that category. Next question. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. hi. My question is about DNA testing. I had the uh, national, well, my brother sent in his DNA sample to the National Geographic, and uh, now I've transferred it to the family tree, and they had a test to, you know, see about Indian blood. And I wanted to check it out because my father said we we're 132nd Cherokee, but I'm wondering if it's really going to tell me anything, because if that's such a s small amount, you know, maybe the test won't really show it? Um, so I have two answers to that question. I get emails every day from people with those kinds of questions. Um, I didn't get a chance to, and again, I can't do the science justice, I'm not a geneticist, um, but what they're looking for are markers that are found in higher and lower frequencies in different populations in the world. And in, in, the, in the Americas, you have five, maybe six, uh, native, what they call Native American mitochondrial DNA haplogroups. You have a couple of Y chromosome DNA haplogroups. Those are distributed throughout the Americas. There are no tribe-specific 
uh, DNA. So um, it, what, it, what it shows is that you would have maternal or paternal ancestry probably in the Americas, but, but not at the level of tribe. Uh, I always send people to a very, very good listserv called genealogy hyphen DNA hyphen L. It's a lot of uh, family tree researchers, professional and amateur, who do genetic testing in concert with the documentary stuff. They are, they, they are the ones to go to to ask which companies and what they do. There's another company, African Ancestry, that also has a listserv, I think, of a lot of people. And they have a larger data set for Africa, um, which is why people who are interested in that go there. So anyway, that's where I send people. The uh, listserv is genealogy hyphen DNA hyphen L. It's on the Ancestry.com set of listservs, Genealogy DNAL. Okay, thank you. The next, uh, I think there are people lined up for questions. Okay, thank you. My granddaughter has a question, so I'm going to translate it for her. Uh, my name is Dr. Bay, and I've been on this cultural course now for almost all my life. In the last 40 some years, I have heard this same kind of dissertation in the assembly of people who are dealing with the African descendant part. So one day I decided, somebody told me I was a Negro, somebody told me I was colored, somebody told me I was uh, black, and somebody told me I was African and African American. And I looked at my family tree, I'm from a place called Charles City, I don't know if you know about Charles City, Charles City County, Virginia. and. We got family members. We have one family member in the Bowman family group, four brothers, and this system classified one as colored or Negro, one as white, one as Indian, and I think the other one was classified as a Negro too. Same mother and same father. Now for me, I look at the spiritual side of it. You can have DNA, you can have blood and all this kind of stuff, and we're still walking the same path that was set for us by the insanity of the minds that decided that they have the right to categorize people, animals, plants, and things. I had to stop. So on my paper, I know my grandfather was of the Powhatan Confederation. I know my grandmother on my father's side was Cherokee. So what that make me? I can't find anything about Africa in my bloodline or Africans, you see? So I accepted though, I'm not denying it, I accept it, but I'm sure that there are plenty of people in that dilemma. And then it hit me one day, if you keep saying you're not Indian, that diminishes the number of Indians. And not that we're called Indians anyway. I just want to deal with it from the truth. And I would like to ask you, haven't you ever thought about it from that perspective? I know I got a PhD. I know we all went to college and all those kind of things. But somewhere deep inside of our heart and in our guts, do we really want to keep moving in the direction that has already been set and perpetuated? Myself, personally, I think it's time for a change. Is there a panel response? I didn't quite get what the question was at the end. Don't you think that it's time to start changing it to move in the real direction instead of keep on coming off the same platform of this physical identification? We, we're, still moving, we're still moving in the same direction that's already been set. And the conversations and the panel discussions and all the educational uh, panels that we've set up all around the country continue to move along this, this line of thought. But I'm saying deep in your heart, there's something else going on. A shaman found me. I wasn't looking. So there's some spiritual things that we don't address when we come to gatherings like this. Yeah, I mean, I think clearly what we have isn't working. Um, none of us up here, though, have offered any solutions to what will work. And that's because this is a really difficult problem. I mean, you know, I, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of scholarship coming out of, I'm very involved in Native American and Indigenous studies. We all are. Um, there's a lot of critique of blood quantum out there in the scholarly world. And you get people who say, well, why don't we use cultural criteria? Well, I don't think it's going to be any easier to have any culture police deciding what's culturally traditional and what's not than it is to enforce blood quantum. It's very, very difficult to come up with some with solutions. So, yeah, it's not that things shouldn't be done differently, and it's not that what we have isn't working. But um, I, I have nothing else. It's, I don't know what you know. I don't know what we do. I don't think any of us has an answer. If we did, we would have solved this problem by now. Sorry, that's kind of a non-response. Yeah, I guess my contribution to the non-response is is that. Um, 
we can talk, unfortunately, all day long, all afternoon, all of us agreeing that blood quantum as a system of determining identity does not work. The problem is how many policymakers are in this room, you know, or listening on the webcast, particularly in the case of, well, let's just take the current Cherokee Friedman debate and the Department of the Interior, you know, making its threats to the integrity of the Cherokee Nation and its ability to determine its membership. Um, I don't take a side on that issue. I think most people feel compassion for all sides of the issue, and most people are looking for alternate sources of knowledge to determine uh, tribally-based identity. Th the fundamental problem, though, is that the federal government doesn't care. They're not listening. Um, and th it's very convenient for them to continue this same line about what creates an Indian in order as a way to continue to solve the quote-unquote Indian problem. That's, although throughout our various watershed periods of policy change, fundamentally it's all come down to transforming Indians to make them go away. And, you know, this, the other side of the self-determination coin is termination, right? So, you know, I don't have an answer. I wish uh, more people would read Eva's book and, and think about, um, oh my gosh, I've now forgotten the name of the concept that you articulated in the in the. Um, Indigenous, what Radical indigenous. Radical <laughs> indigenism, thank you. Um, but, you know, which is a way of thinking about um, these questions that really, you know, forces you to ask hard, hard questions, not just of the, the man or the authorities or the tribal government, but of you yourself and the basis of your identity and keeping that honest and keeping that real. Um, and it's from that kind of starting point that these policies eventually you know, if, if global warming doesn't swallow us all up, may change eventually. And I, I would put in my two cents here, which is that I, I think that one could respond to the kind of issues that our colleague has, has raised um, on either a tribal level or an individual level. And at a tribal level, um, I think, I mean, it would be really wrong for any one of us up here to announce that this is what the solution to the problem is, because that can only be decided within tribal communities, and the answer is going to be different in, in those different communities, and that's appropriate. What I was hoping when I wrote that book was um, just to open a space to really invite tribal communities to remember that for a very, very long time, like as, as far back as our tribe lasts probably, we have had to answer that question of who are we, and we had ways to do it. Um, and and those, those ways, we can begin to recollect them by looking at places like our own sacred stories and then talking amongst ourselves about how we might make the translation to the needs of today and now, but remembering certain principles that have guided us for a long time and being very prayerful about that too. Um, so at a tribal level, that, that, that's one possible answer. At an individual level, um, when I hear people talking about um, an interest in establishing genealogical ancestry and, and things like that, I, I tend to think of, there is a wonderful friend of mine named Ed Fields at Cherokee Nation um, that he told me one time, he says, a lot of times people will come through the tribal complex and they're very interested in doing genealogical research. They come from all over the country and they're, you know, looking through records and trying to figure out, like, where is my ancestry and what would my blood quantum be if it could be calculated, if I could identify this ancestor. And they may go home very disappointed when they can't find the person because they have information in their family that, that they know that they have some ancestry, but they haven't been able to find it. And he says... Um, sometimes I say to them, um, maybe this isn't the thing that you need to be worried about, this, like assigning this number to yourself or identifying who is, who is this ancestor. He says, maybe you should think more about, instead of about trying to say about being an, a Cherokee person, maybe you should start doing Cherokee things. And what he meant by that is that Native communities, what I was talking about in the talk I gave today, is there's this idea of a responsibility to reciprocity, that each of us has these unique and wonderful talents that we have that we can share with our tribal community, that we can make donations of um, from what the Creator gave us. And so people can do things like learning our language, volunteering in our immersion school, 
um, helping with grant writing, doing all kinds of things, doing Cherokee things in the sense of doing things that build up our community. And maybe, not, may, maybe this whole idea of attaching a number to yourself is, is just really not the most important thing. Maybe the important thing is living in responsible relationship in that way. So it was a whole other way to think about that question. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is S.D. Smith. I'm the general counsel for the Ramapo Lenape Nation outside New York and New, uh, New Jersey. And I want to thank you all for this uh, very interesting talk and just give uh, greetings from, from my chief, Dwayne Perry. And I just had a, a question. I apologize. I uh, was uh, coming from out of town, so I was a bit late. So if you answer this question, I just would like your patience and Answering it again, uh, our, our situation is kind of interesting on a on a community level. I mean, we were recognized by the state of New Jersey and New York, but we were denied federal recognition in the 1990s. Uh, one of my uh, tribal brothers was telling me that it was um, that the Supreme Court decision says that we're Indian, but somehow we're not Indian enough. I'm not sure exactly how that came down, but. I was wondering if you all could talk about, say, blood quantum, DNA, some of these issues, but on, not so much on an individual level, but on a more of a community or, or group level. And, I'm, I know we're not unique. I know a lot of other groups have gone through this process as well. I know there's been people who have had federal recognition, and they were terminated and then re-recognized and then not recognized again. So if you all could talk about some of these issues, I, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Just uh, one quick thought on the federal acknowledgement process and its inherent flaws, which a number of us, of course, are aware of, and so are you all in the audience, um, is that the, the, the criteria that the Bureau of Indian Affairs derived in 1978 fundamentally deny that uh, Indian people can change and that colonialism has happened. Um, the criteria ask for example you know for outsiders to recognize this particular group as native when an outsider doesn't know what it's looking at he or she is looking at they're not going to be able to identify anybody correctly and so the criteria claim that they're politically based in in the sense of can you demonstrate you know continuous political authority and continuous political organization over since historic times or I think recently revised to the last hundred years. But the evidence they ask for to demonstrate that criteria is, is ethnically based. It's, it's, it's ethnocentrically based on a, on a European-American perspective, a definition of what a Native American person is. Um, and so blood quantum is part of that uh, ethnocentric definition of what a Native American person is. And it generally comes out, I think, in the minds of most European Americans in phenotype in the way that you look. Um, people don't know how to judge me, for example, because I'll, you know, I can tell them I'm Indian all day long, but I just don't look it. And um, some folks accept that and they're fine with still, you know, me being Indian. Other folks are like, well, wait a minute, you know, that means you're getting something I'm not. You got into college when, instead of me or whatever. And, um, you know, getting back to the question that was asked earlier, you know, we as communities have to begin to wrestle with these questions in order to present an alternative to the federal government. I think one of the benefits of the Lumbees not being federally recognized, and this is something that Sam Deloria um, said at the funeral for Helen Sherbeck in, down in Pembroke, he said that the Lumbees are an example of how to be Indian without the federal relationship. Um, and I think many of our tribes, both federally recognized and non-federally recognized, are consumed with the federal government's criteria. Understandably so. Um, but when you have been living in such, a, such absence of that pressure for such a period of, long period of time as we have, we have become accustomed to um, simply making our own practices the priority um, and building them into our constitution. Not that we don't have dysfunctional tribal government like everybody else does. But, um, you know, there are many assets, I think, to 
having your natural resources outside the boundaries of control of the federal government, such as, you know, in the Ramapo case. People still have community. They have strong community cultural ties. And um, the natural, natural resources are threatened consistently. The problem with not having a federal government to government relationship is that there's very little legal recourse to address those natural resource issues when they come up. Um, and so it depends on, you know, scarcity and a lot of people working for free to fight battles that um, otherwise the federal government's trust responsibility can help you fight. I have forgotten where I was going with this now, but <laughs> essentially I think your, I think your situation is, is not unique and it's in fact something that concerns federally re or should concern federally recognized tribes as well as non-federally recognized tribes because as, as Matt's you know, presentation demonstrated, the blood, blood quantum rules mean that there's going to be no Indians um, and that's exactly what they're looking for. So let's, you know, try to address that question, come up with a different paradigm, and push for it within our communities first. Thank you also. Greetings to the people of the past. Um, we're at, um, I just wanted to let you know that, that we're about at 4.30, but um, I'd like to go for another 15 minutes because of the technical issues. How many people can stay another 15 minutes? Okay, enough people. <laughs> so, all right, go ahead and go next. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the afternoon so far. I have a question to all of you that is something that's been perplexing me for some time. It's, it's the intersect between identity, activism, and the bigger political issues. And referring back to Cheryl Harris and her work on the myth of color blindness and the issues that go with uh, effectively a, a speaking as a non-Native American, tribalism and looking inwards, if you were to turn yourselves around as you do often and look outwards and see these problems with the pernicious effects of a new conservative colorblind policy, where is the activism coming from? Where is it going to come from? Is it from urbanized uh, Indians? Is it from binding together in different and novel ways? I want to throw that out to you because it's concerned. Students ask me this all the time. Where is it going to come from? Uh, could you explain just a little bit more about what you mean by colorblind, act, colorblind policies? and? Act it, it's this whole post-affirmative action uh, environment that Cheryl Harris talks about in terms of uh, it seems to be a political this is a uh, it's, she's putting it hypo hypothetically with a lot of evidence behind it though is this idea that uh, the um, a new colorblind policy effectively eliminates the obligations of government to work for and on the benefit of different minorities in this country. Right, this is a theory this yes is, okay <laughs> Just, just no, but sure. I mean, it's, it's very much. <laughs> it's like, it's have we out gotten there, there yet? Wait, what happened? No, no, it's out there, and I'd like you to, if you could, comment on that and whether it's relevant to where you see your search for identity at the moment, and whether you are able to to counteract this hypothetical situation. Well, I'll, I'll start, but I'm not going to talk very long because I'm not good on this issue for a lot of reasons. Uh, but one of them is, one of the reasons I'm not good on the issue is because as a Lumbee person and speaking of my identity as an individual, as a member of a community, color has got nothing to do with it. So I think many of our, our non-white so-called communities in the United States have been defined by color by virtue of the, of the system of white supremacy. Without the system of white supremacy, we, pr we probably wouldn't have race as a construct, at least not as it exists in this nation, not the way it plays out. Race is a concept that's dependent on white supremacy. Um, color is a concept that's dependent on white supremacy. And when you think about the census records and how they've evolved over time, you know, people have been identified in the census by color during the 19th century and only by race in the 20th century. And those are different concepts that we have to analyze and take seriously. 
Um, so color blindness to me is, is something that is, is a world that I already live in, I think, uh, I'll not, which is not to say that I'm any less prejudiced or any less ethnocentric than anyone else, but that um, in terms of I one's identity, color is already kind of off the table when you're dealing with Native American sovereignty issues. Those sovereignty issues are set up in such a way so that political community is what, or politics and the, the and citizenship is what constitutes the community uh, first and foremost. And when you get to, when you deal with other um, non-whites in the United States, color comes to the fore. But this is, you know, this is why Native Americans are in these kinds of distinct categories and I kind of war with myself sometimes about whether the extent to which it makes sense to um, join forces with people of other, uh, of other ethnic, ethnic backgrounds. Um, sometimes I think, yes, absolutely, that's the only way to get anything done in the kind of oligarchy that we live in. Um, the other answer is no, you know, we need to maintain our boundaries as tribal nations and negotiate from that standpoint of strength rather than from a standpoint as a minority group. Um, I don't know if that answers the question at all, but I would say I would see activism coming from a standpoint of political sovereignty, however we're going to define that term, which is a whole other discussion. But standpoint of political sovereignty than I would uh, from a standpoint of, of color or race. Hello. First, I'd like to say uh, I found this discussion very enlightening. It raises a lot of questions, uh, and like many of you said, it's not going to answer all those questions. Uh, but for me personally, um, through my own family's research, we found that we have members of our family that are listed in the Dawes Commission reports um, as Cherokees on both my father's side and my mother's side. And so it creates a dilemma for us, you know, when you're trying to figure out, well, what really are we? Um, are we Indians? Are we African Americans? We also have European ancestry. And so when you hear discussions like this and learning the history, I mean, I've seen records that have members of my family that have the little I. We didn't know what that meant. And we, we also found them in the DOS, DOS Commission reports. How do you interpret that information in the context of today? You know, does that make us Indians? Does it make us uh, you know, do we arise to that level where we fall into the category of the Cher Cherokee Nation where most of them seem to come from? So it's, it's a really interesting question. I don't know if any of you can answer any of those questions or shed any light on really what was the modus by, the, the impetus for the Dawes Commission reports, and if you have members listed there, how you should interpret uh, uh, the fact that they're listed in that report. Well, the Dawes Commission records were, it's what's known as the final Cherokee census, and it was assembled in order to allow for land allotment. Um, at, they closed in 1906, so it was supposed to be the count of people who were maintaining legal and political connection to the tribe at that time. Um, and the Cherokee laws say, the Cherokee Constitution now says that people who can trace a linear ancestor, so it means mother, fa mother, 
grandmother, great grandfather, whatever, you know, in, in a straight line from somebody who is enrolled uh, on the Dawes Commission census can apply and become a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Um, so then the, you know, it doesn't matter what other ancestry you have, right? So we have people who have every different possible amaz uh, imaginable ancestry um, in combination with their Cherokee ancestry from someone who's listed on the, <coughs> on the DAS roll who are citizens today. Um, and so that, that is a way to attain that legal status. And then when people, uh, you know, I really would celebrate that, that someone is asking the question, should I do that? Uh, because it's not a question that you take lightly, because it does, among other things, um, require certain responsibilities of people, as well as make them eligible for certain rights. Um, and so a Cherokee Nation citizen, it, from my perspective anyways, is also um, has the obligations of cit a citizen of any other nation to do things like vote and be cognizant of tribal affairs and things like that. Uh, th they will also subject themselves to certain legal obligations that might arise in various circumstances. And then also just from my perspective, um, I always encourage people to think about um, if I'm going to be a member of that group, what am I able to contribute to it? How can I build up the tribal body? Um, how can I be in that relationship of reciprocity? And that's, that's not a legal thing. They can't like require you to do that. That's more of a spiritual sort of thing to really think through uh, how can I learn about my responsibilities to this body that I want to establish peoplehood with. Um, but certainly um, what you're describing is a situation of someone who could apply for citizenship. The, the, the quote that Gabby gave you earlier about the mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass, that's what allotment was supposed to be. The, the, the idea was that they would eliminate the basis of Cherokee peoplehood um, and, and integrate Cherokees in the way that they make them over into a slightly darker counterpart of white f homesteaders. Um, but then the tribe was able to reconstitute itself in the 1970s, and so that's the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, that we know today in Oklahoma. I just wanted to add something. I'm not sure how to say this in a coherent or concise way, but I'm going to try. I, what Eva's saying prompts me to think this. There's a historian of science, I can't remember his name, but Robert Proctor, who's at Stanford, cites this person. And, and this person says, um, evolution, so our understanding of evolution, has conditioned an odd understanding that we are what we were and not what we became. And I think people need to be mindful about this, there's a difference between an individual quest for one's identity. How do I know what I am? Well, you kind of should know what you are. Versus looking to be a member of a political nation that then requires of you certain kinds of responsibilities. And we all fall down on the job with our tribal nations. I speak better Bahasa Indonesia than I speak Dakota because I had to go live there and study and I actually had to use it or I couldn't buy tomatoes at the market. <laughs> it doesn't happen in South Dakota. So we all fall down as, as, as citizens of our tribes, but there, that, that, there's, a, there's a fundamental difference there between what the group requires and your responsibilities to the group and your own individual quest for identity. And this is what often gets lost in these discussions. Native people are about group. You know, we're about, and, and our, we're about being land-based people that have a tie to that land and, and culture and land and biology are all entangled with politics. This isn't just about the individual, right? And so... I just, I caution us to remember that. And I, and I know we all know that, but, but I, I get concerned um, when this becomes about personal identity all the time. And it's why it's ho so hard to give these talks, actually. We're going to take one more question. I know you've been waiting a very long time. And apologies to other people who have questions, but we'll have an ongoing conversation on this. Um, I, I think that that last comment was a good one. I know who I am. It's taken me 20 years in my PhD to document that, um, so I make that distinction. Uh, I am of Cherokee Freedmen descent, but I'm a member of Muscogee Creek Nation. So my manuscript is in the works, and hopefully it will um, enlighten some people. 
but I think one of the things that we talked around is this idea of the federal policy Im instrument and that uh, we need to question that policy as it was dictated a little more honestly at both the individual and the tribal level so that we acknowledge that the absence of certificate of degree of Indian blood for people of mixed African American Indian might well be on those Cherokee freedmen, should be Cherokee citizens if they went back and really documented that genealogical co connection to the tribe rather than being dismissed. And I think you know what I'm talking about there. Uh, the other policy that didn't get mentioned is this idea that you can only belong to one tribe. You can only, uh, in terms of sovereignty. There are many people who I see slash, you know, Shawnee slash Delaware, what have you. And the way the blood quantum is counted for those people in terms of the benefit of services and what have you is also a federal, federally driven um, policy uh, instrument. So I think that uh, one idea to put out there for us all to consider is at the tribal level, at the individual level, all of those decision points that tribes took historically through one treaty or another that excluded or narrowed the definition can be reversed can be dismantled in terms of being more inclusive to mixed race members who were excluded over the years. So that's one active um, intertribal action that could be taken. I would just say as, as a practical point um, that the Cherokee Nation has recently taken seriously the concern of some people who are on the freedmen rolls that maybe they actually do have uh, Cherokee ancestry by, by blood, which would allow them to become citizens now. Um, and they have sponsored uh, special workshops that would help people trace that genealogy um, if they can identify another ancestor that is Cherokee, a direct ancestor that maybe they didn't know about, uh, that the tribe actually has these workshops where they will help people um, establish that, and if they can establish that, to switch their um, listing from uh, Cherokee freedmen to Cherokee by blood uh, so that they be can become enrolled. So if anybody wanted to, to pursue that, they could call the tribe and find out when some of those workshops are happening, because I know they have been. Yeah, it's a matter of who owns the voice, who owns the story. And if the whites are going to continue to own the story, then we have little we can do. Yeah. I All right, thank you. With that, I'm going to go ahead and conclude our panel. I'd like to give my greatest thanks to Matt Snip, Eva Garut, Melinda Maynard-Lowry, Kim Tallbear for spending the time, and also with all of you who spent uh, the time with us this afternoon. Obviously, as everybody said, yes, Indian blood does matter. <laughs> I mean, that was kind of a rhetorical question. There's fi over 563 
federally recognized tribes, a couple hundred more state recognized, millions of more people who counts in some way or the other native ancestry, that many or more times itself exponentially opinions, viewpoints, lived experiences. But I think it was very important for us to spend this time to really look at the context, the history, some of the facts, the data, the framing uh, from many different perspectives. So this is not the end of the conversation. It's just a step along the way. And I look forward to having more dialogue with all of you. Thank you very much. Um, also, I just want to mention that this, the webcast will be up um, on YouTube uh, in probably in a couple days, and it's already probably immediately up on Ustream, so you can see it again.